Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three.
test one, two, three. We can hear you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can anyone please confirm if they can hear me? We can hear you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good morning, morning Kelly. Good morning, everybody. I feel like we just saw each other. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't you... that long ago. Yeah. No, how are you feeling, Eli? Did you get some rest? Oh, well, 
surviving. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It was it was a long day yesterday for me. I must admit it. So. Well, you have like a heavenly glow about you now. You're you're looking you're looking much better. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start the meeting in one minute. On va commencer la réunion dans une minute. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue à la réunion du Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique, une réunion extraordinaire. Welcome to a special meeting of FEDCO uh, for Tuesday, October 19th. Uh, I want to thank all those members who participated in the official plan. I know that was a long uh, evening and uh, day and weeks, and we thank uh, the public for their input and thank uh, our elected officials and staff for the long hours you put in um in an important document and today we have another important item before us a new um, branch uh, central branch for the ottawa public library so before we proceed i'll do a quick roll call of all members uh, concierge cloutier councillor de Ruse. here mr mayor that's not councillor de Ruse. we have sound on you councillor we can I'm hear here. mr we don't seem to have sound for Councillor DeRue, so we'll have to fix that. Uh, yeah, Council I'm here. We can hear you, George. At least I can. We can hear you, we can see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Councillor DeRue. Here. here. There we go. Councillor El Shantiri. Here. here. Councillor Gower. See Councillor Gower. Is your mic working, Glenn? Here, here. Right. Uh, Councillor Hubley. Here. Councillor Luloff. Present. Councillor Moffat. Here. Councillor Tierney. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Dudas. I'm here. Any declarations of uh, conflict of interest, declaration d'intérêt? No, um, but Councillor Klutze just pop up, Mr. Oh. Mayor. He's in the meeting. Great. Hello, Councillor. Good morning. Uh, planning, infrastructure, and economic development. Uh, service de planification de l'infrastructure de développement économique. Uh, Adusoke, Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada Joint Facility, Project Update and Procurement Tender Results. So we have just one item on the agenda, and we have um, a presentation by Steve Willis and Simon Dupuy. And then we have three members of the public who have signed up to speak uh, to the item. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Willis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make sure the presentation is on the screen as well. Thank you, Kelly. So if we can go to the... Thank you, Mayor and members of FEDCO. Thank you for the opportunity to present today, which is the last approval staff need from Council to bring to start at Asoke, the new joint facility of the Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives to Canada. Merci de me permettre de prendre la parole aujourd'hui à propos de la dernière approbation du Conseil dont le personnel a besoin pour l'installation à Asoke, la nouvelle bibliothèque partagée de la Bibliothèque publique d'Ottawa et de la Bibliothèque et Archives Canada. This is our last approval since Council previously authorized the site, approved the agreement with Library and Archives Canada, gave staff the authority to design and tender the project, and it previously gave staff an upset limit under which the contract could be awarded. After a competitive tender process, the lowest bid exceeds the authority Council previously gave staff, so we're here today at FedCo and ultimately Council to seek the authority for the winning price of the tender process. 
Simon Dupuy will do the presentation today, and I have some brief opening remarks. But before I do that, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank Alain Gontier, who has uh, really very much on behalf of planning infrastructure and economic development, even despite his posting in public works, has assisted me directly in uh, overseeing this project as I've been involved in other matters uh, much of the time lately. Uh, I want to thank Danielle uh, McDonald from the uh, Ottawa Public Library and her team. They have been excellent partners within the city family. I want to thank Leslie Weir, the Library and Archivist for Canada, and her press predecessor, Guy Bertiaume, who also deserves thanks, uh, because uh, this is an extraordinary, unique partnership nowhere else in Canada, and they have been great partners. And I also want to thank Dan Chenye as well, because uh, as, as uh, our department is responsible for design and construction, ultimately Dan's team will be the facility uh, responsible for the facilities. Next slide, please. Ce projet est une, une excellente occasion pour la ville et son partenaire fédéral d'ajouter une pièce importante à la trame um, tram urbaine d'Ottawa. This project is an excellent opportunity for the city and its federal partner to do an important piece of city building. When we look at libraries around the world and what they mean now, libraries are very different from what they used to be, and they are important parts of our social, cultural, and economic fabric. If you go to world-class cities like London, New York, Halifax, and Calgary, the libraries are now in the tour guides for the city. They become an important attraction. They become a very significant piece of a statement of the city's identity. Next slide, please. Just in the context, when I talk about city building, and I will over the next couple of slides show you more of this, this is an important step to fill in a blank piece of the city and actually rectify a problem that has existed for decades. This is the chance to really kick off and spur on the work in La Breton Flats and complements nicely the work the National Capital Commission is currently doing. Next slide, please. With this is how the first significant building from the escarpment to the to the, uh, down to Le Breton Flats will fill in the space and start bringing the city towards the river. Next slide, please. Sorry, these slides are out of order. There is a excuse me. There was a slide. Okay, I'm sorry. Excuse me. There was a, there was a slide showing a, a historical photograph in, uh, of the lands from the 1950s that showed the demolition of the lands. And if actually, if we can go back to the two slides back, please, just the the one showing the overall context. Another slide, please. So this land was cleared in the 1950s and the 1960s by the government of Canada to build additional federal campuses that were never actually built. And to put this in context, uh, this site has been vacant for over 60 years. And um, I always tell people this site has been demolished and vacant since before I was even born. And I'm not the I'm not the oldest in the room or the youngest in the room, but I don't feel particularly young anymore, Mr. Mayor. And it is time, and I hope that uh, my children will see this site filled in and become part of the city again. The former region acquired this site from the National Capital Commission in the 1990s, late 1990s, and it has been used as a parking lot for much of its life since it's cleared. And it can have a much more noble purpose within the fabric of our city. It can offer so much more uh, to our citizens than a parking lot. Next slide, please. If we can go to the next slide, please. When the library is built, and this slide is from combines the library design with some designs from the zoning study we did several years back, uh, the library will be part of a composition of buildings along the Wellington Street front, Wellington Albert frontage. So we'll have the library closest to Bronson Avenue, the site immediately next to the library, which is going to be used for construction staging in the short term to build the library. It's also owned by the city, and the city has already identified that it will become an affordable housing project. And my colleagues in Community and Social Services Department will launch uh, a partnership process for that project once we get closer to the completion of construction. And then on the left side of the screen is the site owned by 
the National Capital Commission immediately adjacent to Pimency Station, and uh, their board in January will consider the winning proposal for the construction and development of that site. So all of these three activities in tandem really spur that bridge that I talked about between Upper Town, historic Upper Town, and the flats. And this all realizes what Council has worked on for many years in the escarpment plan and the new downtown uh, uh, secondary plan. So I'm now going to ask Simon to walk you through the recommendations today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Members Committee. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Chair and Committee Members, for the opportunity to provide an update on the Ottawa Public Library, the Library and Archive Canada. Yep, um, Simon, sorry, can you speak closer to the microphone, please? Sorry about that, Mr. Mayor, does that sound better? Perfect. Uh, I'll start again. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Chair and Committee Members, for the opportunity to provide an update on the Ottawa Public Library, Library and Archives Canada Joint Facility, now known as Arasoke. Next slide, please. Just a reminder of what this facility entails. The facility is a 220,000 square foot facility, including shared and unique spaces for both OPL and LAC, plus a 200 vehicle underground parking facility. It includes three retail spaces, a restaurant, cafe, and gift shop, a children's area, an auditorium, exhibition space, genealogy lab, extensive collection and reading areas, a demonstration kitchen, indigenous gathering spaces, recording studio, a box box theater, and much more. This facility is the largest social infrastructure investment in the city's history. It will be the largest non-federal tourist de destination in Ottawa on day one of opening. We expect 1.5 million visitors on opening day annually, making Arisoke the most visited building in Ottawa. And as Steve noted, it will be an important catalyst and anchor of the Breton Flats development. Next slide, please. Beyond what the facility contains, there are many other things that make this facility unique, both nationally and locally. It was truly co-designed with the public and Indigenous communities. It is a building that will serve this community for generations, forming part of the parliamentary district. It is a partnership with the Library and Archives Canada, which will allow Ottawa Public Library users ready access to the National Archival Collections. And finally, it is the first building of its kind to achieve a net zero carbon status. Next slide, please. In sum, the Atasoke facility will be a rare, truly democratic facility where everyone can access and avail themselves of all the facility has to offer free of charge a place for people of all walks of life to learn, to be inspired, and to come together. Next slide, please. As you are all aware, central libraries are having something of a renaissance on the world stage, as cities look to improve the social life, cohesion, and attraction to their city by designing and constructing beautiful and functional central buildings. These libraries are wildly successful, and consistently we have heard that the large to more, most pervasive challenge they face is their massive popularity. They wear the carpets out. Up on the screen, you can see some recent examples in Seattle, Calgary, and Salt Lake City, where their central libraries have become some of the most popular destinations in their city. Next slide, please. On public engagement, building on the city's ongoing commitment to be a leader in this space, the project partner set out an objective to have this facility truly co-designed, not to bring designs to the public for comment, but instead to have the public contribute to the design from the ground up. We first went to the public asking how and with what mode they wanted to access the site, which ultimately guided the orientation of the building and the entrance locations. We asked what form the building should take, how the program spaces should be configured in relation to each other. We asked about public art. We asked about accessibility and sustainability, about materials and finishes, and about what inspired them. After each session, the project team and the architects worked together to advance the design based on the feedback we received. At the following sessions, presenting what we heard and ensuring that how it was incorporated into advancing the designs was validated. Next slide, please. We sought to develop the same co-design relationship with the local and national indigenous communities and groups. We received significant feedback, which resulted in many design and programming features. This spirit of collaboration and partnership extended to our relationship with the host nation, specifically the communities of Kitty Kanzibi and Pekwakagon. Engagement takes the work of two parties and these communities' interest, passion, and input was truly inspiring. 
As is evidenced in the renderings, every aspect of the building design has been influenced and inspired by the detailed and regular sessions held with these community representatives. Next slide, please. Discussions were had sitting in a circle, participating in ceremonies as a cultural exchange focused on learning from Indigenous knowledge and history. On our very first design meeting, one of the community elders brought a handmade wigwam model he had created, which became the inspiration for the Indigenous meeting room in the facility. You can see the Indigenous inspiration in the children's area with the wigwam inspired storytelling room in the colors, the natural materials, the size and warmth of the atrium, the gathering circle in the landscaping, and the local Indigenous plants that will be used in the outdoor space adjacent to the Indigenous meeting room. Next slide, please. Over the course of this engagement, a natural partnership was formed, leading to changes and additions on other aspects of the project that extend beyond the design, including smudging being permitted in the facility, Anishinaabe Algonquin on all wayfinding signs, as well as French and English, a land acknowledgement displayed at the East Albert entrance, a video showcasing Algonquin history will be played on repeat in the facility, and inclusion and showcasing of Algonquin in Indigenous art and literature. Next slide, please. In recognition of this partnership with the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, the communities gave the facility the name Adesoke, which is an Anishinaabe one word that refers to the telling of stories. Next slide. Please. The result of all this engagement was a design for the joint facility, which was first shown to the public in winter 2019, with the final design showcased in spring 2021. The design was universally well received locally, nationally, and internationally. This is a view looking westward from Wellington, highlighting the Pimacy entrance. Next slide, please. One of the first significant aspects of public feedback was that the building should reflect the site and be embedded into the landscape. Consequently, the architects took inspiration from the Ottawa River, the Stone of the Escarpment, and the treat areas. Together, these offered a palette for the architectural expression. Next slide, please. Here's one of the very first sketches of melding these three concepts into a cohesive design, where the flow of the water creates the roof line held in place by stone, with the warmth of the wood being the welcoming materials on the ground floor. Next slide, please. On this view from Albert Street, you can see how the undulations of the roof line frame the skyline. Next slide. And on this view, the warmth of the entrance is framed by wood. Another noteworthy aspect of the design is that it is in compliance with the City of Ottawa's new bird-friendly design guidelines with extensive fritting over the glazing. Next slide, please. Here you see the building from the Pimacy entrance, the backdrop of the city's downtown to the east. This is a multi-storied entrance, and just to the right of the entrance is the auditorium glass back wall that you will see in later renderings. Next slide, please. Here is the view of the landscaping with Albert to the south and the multi-use pathway connecting Pimacy to the north. Next slide, please. Earlier this year, the Government of Canada contributed an additional 20 million to make the facility net zero carbon. This has resulted in a sustainable design including upgrading building insulation, triple glazed windows, green roof, rooftop and building integrated solar panels, interior green wall, and many more features. These, in combination with heating and chilling provided via the Federal Government District Energy System, will ensure this facility is one of the most environmentally sustainable central libraries in the world. Next slide, please. You can see here how well the design melds into the landscape which had noticed previously was a strong piece of direction from the public and Indigenous communities. Next slide, please. This is just a shot of the interior atrium that features some of those sustainability features, including the green wall. You can also feel the warmth and the size and the natural light emitting into the atrium, which was key from the public feedback as well. Next slide, please. Here is the auditorium that I referred to earlier, and you can see how the glazing in the back allows a view both in and out of the landscaped areas. Next slide, please. And the children's area, you can see the earth tones, which were also a significant feedback from the public. You can see the indigenous um, influences, both in the storytelling area, area, as well as the leaf features on the roof. Next slide, please. 
And finally, uh, here's a shot of the fifth floor OPL reading room with the demonstration kitchen in the background. When our principal architect Don Schmidt was asked at the outset of design, what makes an iconic facility? He answered that people see themselves in it and they are attracted to it, and enjoy it for years and years. One of the principal pieces of feedback received during the two design reveals was indeed that people felt that the design reflected their feedback and that it was both beautiful and welcoming. Next slide, please. Now I'm happy to provide an update on the procurement process and tender results. Next slide, please. Throughout the design phase, the project team was aware that Ottawa's construction market and COVID-19 were putting significant pressures on the project cost and schedule. And so the project team undertook a series of comprehensive value engineering exercises to ensure the building scope did not contribute or exacerbate these pressures. These savings are estimated at approximately 100 million and include architectural design efficiencies, material substitutions, and millwork and fixture modifications. Next slide, please. The procurement of the Adesoki facility was managed by City Supply in a traditional design bid build stipulated sum contract model and overseen by a fairness commissioner. It was a four stage process, including a pre qualification, an early works package, which included excavation and site remediation, and a request for tender released to the pre qualified contractors this summer. On September 9th, the bids were received and PCL was identified as the lowest bidder. Next slide, please. As has been communicated via the chair of the OPO board and Steve Willis, via memo, the low bidder has resulted in a 64 million pressure on the OPO LAC component, roughly a 60% increase from the initial estimate developed in 2016. This initial estimate assumed 10% inflation, but actual observed construction inflation in Ottawa to midpoint of construction is currently in excess of 65%, which is the cause of this increase. As outlined in this slide, we have worked with the city's chief financial officer and her office to determine the most effective way to pay for this increase, which is 28 million from the OPL reserves and library dedicated development charge, uh, development charge debt, sorry, and 36 million from the citywide tax supported debt. The chief financial officer has confirmed that the debt amount is affordable within the city imposed debt ceiling through a combination of retiring debt and taking advantage of the preferential interest rates and extending the debt to 40 years. Extending the debt over the additional years, which aligns better with the life cycle of the facility, makes the debt cheaper due to the very low interest rates. Next slide, please. The remainder of the facility's costs also had pressures. The federal portion required an additional 66 million, which includes the federal 20 million net zero carbon addition. This funding has already been approved by the federal government, secured and committed. The additional 10 million in parking pressures will be paid by parking debt and repaid through parking revenues. Next slide, please. As you can see, the Adesokia facility still compares very favorably to its peers in Canada in a cost per square footage, even though it is a net zero carbon facility. Next slide, please. The project team has undergone an extensive engagement process with the general contractors to determine the most financially efficient and realistic construction schedule, given the implications of COVID-19 on the labor and material supply. Consequently, the project schedule has been modified to have the official opening in summer 2026 from 2025. As the existing lease for the main branch at 120 Metcalf can be extended without penalty to the end of 2026, the project team does not anticipate any implications to the schedule change. Next slide, please. Recognizing the increase in costs, staff explored the implications of not proceeding with the project. Firstly, 30 million has already been invested in the project and would be unrecoverable if it were not to proceed. The OPL main branch, which has been sold, has its lease expire in 2026, meaning as of 2027, there would be no central library in Ottawa until another option could be secured. Alternative options, including redesign and retendering, would result in considerable delays, inflationary costs, and the substantial cost of redesign. Finally, the city has a legal agreement with Library and Archives Canada to deliver the project. Defaulting on this agreement would have legal and financial consequences. Next slide, please. This is just, um, we're gonna be talking about recommendations and next steps. Next slide, please. The recommendations in the report request the committee to recommend that council approve the additional funding required for the facility. 
there are two additional funding elements referred to in the recommendations. As outlined in the report, we're working with the social enterprise community in Ottawa in keeping with council's interest in pursuing community benefits from infrastructure projects to have social enterprise organizations provide the management and service of the two food and beverage spaces in the facility. As we had previously anticipated the private sector undertaking this, this fit up amount would have been paid by the private sector or repaid to them from revenues. We are recommending that the city instead provide these funds for the fit up so that it is financially feasible for a social enterprise to manage these spaces. This 1.2 million would be paid back to the city through retail revenues within five years of operation. We are also requesting a transfer from the Albert and Slater Street project for work that was budgeted as part of their scope, but that the Adesoke facility is undertaking because it is more efficient from a construction coordination perspective. In terms of next steps, on the next slide, please. This evening, the OPL board will be considering uh, recommendations related to the facility as well. If approved at FedCo today, these recommendations would go to for council's consideration on October 27th. On before November 8th, if those approvals are secured, we would be awarding the contract to PCL to commence the work with the groundbreaking to occur later this fall. At this point, Mr. Mayor would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Simon, for a very thorough overview of this exciting project. Uh, we have uh, three members of the public who would like to speak. We're um, Leslie Weir. Um, I'm not sure if Leslie Weir is the Chief Archivist and Librarian of Canada. And before Leslie speaks, I want to, on behalf of, um, I know Matt Luloff and Danielle McDonald and, and our whole team, how appreciative we are of the cooperation uh, you and your team have brought to the table for this joint venture. Uh, this is a unique partnership between the federal government and a municipal government, and uh, it wouldn't have happened without a lot of hard work on the part of Leslie. So uh, Leslie, thank you very much for all you've done to get us to this stage, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to join you today and to uh, speak to you um, as uh, Mayor Watson mentioned, uh, I am the Librarian and Archivist of Canada, and um, I came into that role in August of 2019. I had a great six months before COVID started, um, but one of the things that drew me to taking on this role was this exciting project that we're doing in collaboration with the Ottawa Public Library and the City of Ottawa. So I am thrilled to be here, and I am thrilled to be part of this great project. So first of all, I'd like to say as a long time library leader, um, I just want you knowing that our contemporary digital age has not in any way diminished the place of the library as an important gathering place and a center of knowledge, wisdom and culture. Tony Marks, the president of the New York Public Library stated that the library is quietly one of the places that is saving democracy. If that sounds like a self-serving hyperbole, consider that more people visited the New York Public Library in 2017, around 17 million, than all museum visits and sporting events in the city combined. And look at other recent library projects in Canada, Halifax, Vancouver, Calgary. They have become instant public successes and lasting successes, extraordinary community hubs for families, kids, teenage, teenagers, new Canadians, seniors, just to mention a few. And they are economic development drivers in the neighborhoods where they take shape. The facility in Ottawa will be an instant success. With confidence, I can even say that I think it'll have a greater impact than the, of these other success stories in Canada. And why do I say that? Because of Libraries and Archives Canada. Just think for a moment, it will be one of the top central libraries in Canada and internationally. The facility has already begun as a national institution because of our partnership. Um, and what does Libraries and Archives Canada offer? Our collection is the shared documentary heritage of all Canadians. It spans the entire history of our country. 
It contains materials from across Canada and around the world that are of interest to Ottawa, uh, people from Ottawa and uh, to all Canadians. Of all the major memory institutions, Libraries and Archives Canada ranks fourth in the world in the size of its collections, just behind the New York Public Library, already mentioned, the United States Library of Congress and the British Library. Our collection contains more than 55 million items and some 250 linear kilometers of government and private archives. And if you had that material in filing cabinets, you could actually have the filing cabinets run the length between Montreal and Quebec City. So our vast collections assembled over 150 years include more than 20 million books in various different languages. We've got things like rare artist books, first editions to literary classics, and popular fiction, just like the Ottawa Public Library. We have nearly 30 million photographic images, prints, negative slides, and digital photos. We've got 90,000 films, both the short and feature length, documentary, and silent, um, dating back to 1897. We have more than 550,000 hours of audio and video recordings. And we have one of the largest collections of art in Canada, 425,000 works, which includes watercolors, oil paintings, sketches, caricatures, miniatures. They date back to the 1600s. We also have medals, seals, posters, and coats of arms. And we have 550,000 items, which is one of the largest collections of Canadian sheet music in the world. We hold the Canadian Postal Archives, um, and of course, archives for various individuals and groups that have contributed to Canada's cultural, social, economic, and political development. We have national newspapers from across Canada, from dailies to student newspapers, and from Aboriginal um, magazines to ethnic community newsletters. With this in mind, imagine giving access under one roof to this incredible and rich collection and a collection of a world class. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This innovative collaboration between our major institutions will offer an enriched experience for users and visitor visitors by providing exhibit spaces. With our exhibition capacity, which is only made possible by this unique partnership, the facility also becomes a museum and a must stop destination for visitors from the national capital region and all over Canada and around the world. And they will come to know our country and our city through this facility. We'll have a treasures gallery, a jewelry like a jewel like feature of Adesoke, um, where we will be able to exhibit incredible um, treasures of Canada, the proclamation of the Constitution Act, the earliest known map with the word Canada, a prayer book in the language of the Montagnier Indians. In Flanders Field by John McCrae, we have the original handwritten copy of the most famous poem in Canada. We have the first edition of Anne of Green Gables, and we have the Halifax Gazette, March 23rd, 1752, the first newspaper printed in present day Canada. And we have the patent for the first Canadian snowmobile. So something to interest almost anyone. And to use a famous quote from a baseball movie, Field of Dreams, people will come and they will come to explore our rich collections, to be inspired by our exhibits, to admire the iconic architecture of the facility and to know more about the building for the future with the net carbon zero features and to enjoy a beautiful site close to the river and nature in the heart of the national capital region. To discover many stories, the one of Ottawa, the one of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation who lived here or in memorial times and all the stories. I am sure that this facility, not just its physical envelope, but its soul will touch millions of people over the years and will shine in Ottawa and for Ottawa for decades. The rival, uh, it will rival La Grande Bibliothèque in Paris and Odie in Helsinki. And I can see this incredible asset for the national capital region becoming a highlight in guidebooks such as The Lonely Planet and others. We have envisioned together, what we have envisioned together was only possible by this incredible partnership 
and the government of Canada believes in this vision and so has committed the funding necessary to respond to the increased pressures related to COVID-19 and the superheated construction market in, in the national capital region. Right from the start of this partnership, Black and the Ottawa Public Library saw this building as a win-win project. We will be vacating an iconic building gifted to Canada on its 100th anniversary and moving in with the Ottawa Public Library to an iconic world-class building for the 21st century. Libraries and Archives Canada is proud to be part of this innovative and unique project. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Well, I love your enthusiasm, Leslie, and, and that list of um, items that you have is just a tip of the iceberg. I had no idea you had John McRae's original handwritten poem. That's quite remarkable. And uh, I remember many, many years ago, Jean Piggott, the late Jean Piggott, who was such an inspiration to us all, uh, she and I were, our quest was always to try to get the British North America Act actually physically brought to, to Ottawa and Canada because it's never been, never been here. And we tried through British High Commissioners and letters and they didn't seem to budge, but maybe this will give them some, uh, be some catalyst for them to actually say it can be stored safely and securely so that we as Canadians can see our own constitution uh, in person for the first time. So thank you very, very much and your entire team. I you know Simon and, and uh, Steve and Leslie, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and Danielle, we're all very appreciative of the very uh, positive can-do attitude that you brought and your team brought to the table. And certainly uh, we thank uh, former Minister McKenna, who secured the additional funding, uh, which uh, is going to make this project possible if uh, Council approves it. So thank you. We have a couple of people who have questions for you, uh, starting with our Vice Chair, Laura Dugas. Thank you, Leslie. I, I have to echo the mayor's comments. Your enthusiasm is contagious. And I, I've almost, I'm almost excited and want to run over right now and see if I could access some of those documents and the math. And, um, but I, it's, it's interesting because you mentioned all of these, I think you said more than 50,000 items. Um, right now, is the public able to access all those things in terms of an easily accessible site? What are the limitations on your current location that prohibits Canadians, people from Ottawa, from seeing those things in an easy to access manner? Uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, our building was, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, the building was completed in 1967. Um, and um, actually, there are a few different things. First of all, um, it's a little bit forbidding for people to come in. And so while we welcome a lot of academics and graduate students and historians, some authors and genealogists and government researchers, the public don't actually always feel that comfortable to approach the building. Um, even though we're right there on Wellington Street. And of course your public library is heavily frequented. Lots of people come in. And so we'll get to meet very different audiences. We also, uh, our exhibit space and the environmental conditions at uh, 395 Wellington are simply not safe environments for our treasures. And so those treasures are actually stored in our preservation center over in uh, Gatineau and in some of our other storage facilities. So in fact, they aren't easy for us to, to render accessible and to display and, 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 and show off um, uh, to the public in Ottawa, even though we're physically located here. So we're extremely excited about the opportunity of having, being exposed to more people and being able to showcase our collections. We're even going to be having um, a series of our book collections that can rotate uh, through the spaces. Um, we have an the largest collection of Canadian cookbooks in the world and, you know, different kinds of collections that are going to appeal to different people. And this will create that, that opportunity for us to um, make our collections discoverable. Leslie, what, what would it mean if this project does not proceed for, for Library and Archives Canada? Well, um, our building, uh, 395 Wellington, is slated to become part of the uh, judicial precinct. Uh, downtown, we have uh, the parliamentary precinct. And then we have the Supreme Court, the Federal Court and Justice. And um, there are plans for the building to be taken over 
um, by uh, other government uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, and it would also mean that um, we are not the only ones in our building. We share that building currently. Um, we, for instance, don't have easy access to the theater, so we can't show off our fabulous film collection. And we don't have the spaces to be able to welcome um, the public in our building. Um, and uh, not all parts of the building are as accessible as we would like them to be. So it would actually be quite devastating uh, for us. Um, so yeah. that's it, it yes. Our, our future is engaged. We're doing our visioning exercise right now for Vision 2030. And um, this building that we're speaking of plays a rather critical role in the way we're going to achieve our mandate uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Leslie. I very much appreciate your comments. Thank you, Vice Chair. Councillor Cloutier, please. <clears throat> Merci, M. le maire, et, et merci, Mme Weir, pour votre présentation. Comme le, comme le maire a dit, euh, votre enthou, et, et la maire suppléante a dit, euh, votre, votre enthousiasme est, est bienvenu pour, pour ce projet. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I, I agree that the, the bit of the bunker-like uh, library and archives uh, building with, the, with its uh, little windows is, is not very inviting. I have been in there to, to see films, and I appreciate very much from... My, my past history, you, you bringing up the film history of, of Canada. I want to draw a parallel for my colleagues. Uh, 1967, the, uh, and you say that's when the Library and Archives building opened. That's about when the, a former bakery on uh, Saint Laurent Boulevard became the Science and Technology Museum. And it was recently renewed. And my, my point is that a lot of the collection that was, as you are saying with library and archives in buildings that are just not accessible are now fully accessible, notwithstanding our COVID environment, are now fully accessible to, to uh, the residents of Ottawa and to the residents of Canada in a wonderful building. And so I just wanted to draw that parallel on how important these buildings are. Um, the mayor and the deputy mayor both, both spoke about specific items. In aggregate terms, do you have any idea of how much of the collection is accessible now and how much would be accessible in when this project is completed? Um, do, you, do you have that information for us or? OK, mais merci beaucoup pour cette question. Ça, c'est une question extrêmement intéressante. Um, I would have, to, I don't know the number, but I would okay. say it's in the single digits of percentages. Only about 3% of our collections are actually digitized. And our collections grow every year, um, both our analog printed collections and, and our digital collections. Um, but I, I would have to suggest that um, at any given time, it's, 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 it's probably somewhere between one and 3% of our collections that are easily accessible uh, to, to the public. So it's, it's a tiny amount. Got, got it. And, and I acknowledge that. And, and you know, I, again, I do the parallel with Scientech. Um, because I think only 3% of their collection was accessible prior to the new building and now 5%. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still a doubling of, of what is accessible to, to the residents to, to see, almost a doubling. And so um, it speaks to the vastness of the, of the collection that is on hand, which we appreciate and which curators will, will cycle through, I imagine. Um, uh, the McRae proem and, 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 other, and other documents. So uh, I, I, I think it just speaks to the importance of having a world-class facility that's able to display and so that we can all appreciate the, um, the vastness of, of the, and the wealth of, um, of what we have uh, in our collection. So uh, thank you, Ms. Weir, for your uh, service to the residents of our country and, uh, and for your presentation today. Great, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Luloff, please, as chair of the library board. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And thank you so much, Leslie, uh, for your deputation today. And thank you also for being such a great partner uh, throughout this entire process. And I know uh, that you will make a, a better roommate, uh, even so, uh, moving forward. Um, having uh, gone to visit Library and Archives Canada, your building in Gatineau, uh, I've seen firsthand some of the collections that, um, that you've mentioned. And I'm very excited uh, to have portions of this collection on rotation and display here in the nation's capital. It is certainly befitting of a G7 nation to have these incredible documents on display and accessible to the public uh, in the capital. Although I do realize that they are now housed within the National Capital Region. Um, I'm a little, um, I've got a, a little a little extra love, I think, for, for this side uh, of the river and, and very much looking forward uh, to having those here. And I'm sure uh, that uh, that Councillor DeRuz will be first in line to see that that snowmobile patent. And I'm sure that the mayor is pleased to know uh, that you can't injure yourself on a patent. So that's a good thing as well. Thank you so much for all uh, of your hard work on this project. You've been a wonderful partner and uh, certainly uh, looking forward to you continuing that partnership into the future. Thanks for coming today. Well, thank, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Great. Well, thank you again, Leslie. And our next um, delegation is um, Anita Tenasco, a leader of Algonquin Communities, followed by Della Menes. So, uh, Anita, good morning. There you are. I think I see you. Yes. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Great. The, the floor is yours. Miigwech. Kwe kakana, Anita Tenasco, and Indigenous, Kirigan Zibin, and Donjiba. Greetings, everyone. My name is Anita Tanasco. I'm the Director of Education for the Kirigan Zibi Anishinaabeg community. Thank you all for giving me some time to speak about Adesoke today. I've had the honor of working with elders and community members from Kirigan Zibi and Pekwakanagan for the past few years with the project team for the new Ottawa Public Library, Library and Archives Canada facility. It's been truly an honor to sit together in a circle uh, in various consultations meetings and to really participate in respectful engagement. I wanna thank the City of Ottawa, the OPL, LAC um, employees for working with the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation in a in a truly respectful, meaningful way. I understand that the facility has a budget issue here, and I understand that you're looking for value for, for a dollar, but this facility is so important to the city of Ottawa. This is our opportunity to make Ottawa a truly respectful and uh, representative of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. This is our time to really put the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation at the forefront so that all visitors to this new facility will gain a better understanding of our nation. Will, they will understand First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. And we so need this at this time. September 30th is one day of the year where we're hoping that Canadians and non-Indigenous peoples will reflect on our history, the true history of this country. But I firmly believe that Adesoke, with its unique design, with its materials, with its Indigenous art, its Indigenous spaces for learning, for exchanges, for discussions, are so important for Ottawa, for Canada, and how we represent ourselves to the world. I think if we move away from the current design, we're losing something. And I know that people from my nation will be disappointed that all of our discussions, our recommendations, our engagements with our artists and our knowledge keepers may be put aside. And we're hoping that our words will be reflected in this new facility and that our hopes and dreams that we put into the design of this new facility will come to, come to light. This is an opportunity for us to 
to work on reconciliation. This is a, an opportunity for us to collaborate in such a strong, meaningful way. So we certainly hope that the funding will be found for this facility. We have had a strained relationships with books due to the Indian residential school system, due to Indian day schools, due to the 60s scoop, you name it. Indigenous peoples haven't had the best relationships with books. Now we've had an opportunity to contribute to the new Ottawa Public Library, Library and Archives Canada facility. We want to make this our home away from, ho from home, right in our territory here, the Anishinaabe Aki, Algonquin territory. So please consider all of the work that we've done together, Indigenous peoples, non-Indigenous peoples, people within the city of Ottawa, and Canadians as a whole to make this such a beautiful place for learning, for sharing, for exchanges, for really moving together in, in a good way. Let's make our future positive. Let's move forward um, in a way where the calls to action, the TRC calls to action come to fruition, that we see something concrete. I see this project as enacting uh, part of the calls to action. And I see this project as, as a positive way, once we move forward out of COVID, post COVID, we can look back and say, wow, we built such an incredible facility together, Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples. So I thank you for your time today, Kichimigwech. Well, Anita, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for your um, very thoughtful presentation this morning. But more importantly, we're very grateful for you being um, with us on this project from day one. And you put a lot of hours, I know, into uh, meetings and discussions and consultations. And uh, it, it does uh, mean a tremendous amount uh, to us. And we thank you very, very much for all of your efforts. Uh, Councillor Luloff has a question for you. Thank you. I just wanted to say Chimigwech Wijiwagan. We're very, very pleased uh, that you were able to come out and speak uh, to us today uh, and for your continued partnership. This is just the beginning of this partnership. There is so much, so much more work to do, and I look forward to doing that work with you. Chimigwech. Thank you so much. When I hear talk of not proceeding with the project or totally redesigning the project, it, it really hurts the heart because we put so much time and effort and thought into this whole process, into the design process. Miigwech. Your partnership has meant so much to us and I hope that you see yourself in this facility and very much looking forward uh, to standing a shoulder to shoulder with you uh, on the opening of this uh, incredible, incredible library. Mr. Mayor, you are on mute. It's only been 18 months. I should have figured that out by now. Um, our next uh, speaker uh, is Della Maness. Della with us? Good morning. Oh, I hear you, Della. Good morning. <laughs> there, and I see Hi. you now. Great. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Yours. I'm sorry I got booted out there for a couple seconds. Our sister, our internet in our community is is not the best at times, but we're trying to get that remedy. But good morning to everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words to the committee here. Uh, as Anita expressed, we have worked hard on this project. You know, we we have developed a relationship with the committees. And, and that is a start to, to build that respect and, and trust for everyone. Um, it was quite amazing when the committee members came into our community and did a presentation. And from there, we were able to get a couple of our community members to sit on this committee. And they were so happy to say, oh, they've come to us. We're being involved in this. They've, they've uh, you know asked us to participate and want our input. And that made everybody feel really good because at times things come to us, but they never really seem to go anywhere. And, but this one committee has done great. 
Um, one of the things that Mary you have mentioned about tourism. I'm part of the Indigenous experiences in Ottawa and also part of when Rendezvous Canada comes to Toronto or the different cities in Canada. And one of the things they always ask is, where can we go find out information about your people and other people in Canada? We want to learn more about them. And with this new facility, you know, it can be a thing as part of our where this is where you can go. Go to our new Ottawa Public Library, Archives Canada there. They will house a lot of Indigenous artists, books, um, you know, and, and that they can take back with them when they go back to their different countries. And, um, you know, each year we bring over, you know, maybe 300 participants from Europe alone to come to Canada just to see, to learn about our history. Um, when I got the email about this uh, budget, special budget meeting, it was, I was a little disappointed at first because, and then I thought about it, well, we're always in that situation. We may put a budget forth, but things do change, cost changes, everything. And, but we always learn how to adapt and still bring the project to light. Um, you know, our members from both communities, we put our thoughts into the design, uh, like our assignment I pointed out about our elder from Pigwaknagon who designed a small design of the wigwam, which was taken and developed into more of a contemporary design. And he was very, very touched about that. And to take that away, and not be able to move forward, it's it's disheartening. Where do we go from here? Are things going to change? You know, but I hope things do not change. I mean, we've all put a lot of time and work and effort into it, going back and forth to Ottawa. Uh, when we did the official unveiling of the name of the new facility, we brought down our communication specialists and they did an article in our newsletter to all our memberships. And we have had very, very good comments. That was great, excellent, glad to see these partnerships are being developed. Glad to see that, you know, with truth and reconciliation, they are moving forward with us to, to recognize that. And this is, a way that, and, and the even comments, the video that was made was some of our members were saying they have their grandparents in Archives Canada that they have never had the opportunity to see. And for them, that bridges that, that gap that has been there. I get to see my great grandmother speak the language. There's a video there made of her. And, and that's what um, Willie Dick had, had said on the video. He said, oh, that's great. He said, we can go in there and find out about our history because there is gaps in our history. And a lot of those documents are in Archives Canada. And any time we need to go to Archives Canada, we need to have a band council resolution just to go in and look at those files. And hopefully those things would change. And even with the library to bring in our own writers, our own artists, we have community members who are starting to look at writing their own books about our history of our community. And it just, there is an old place to put it, let alone in our own libraries here. And it's a sharing. And I do hope that you know, we move forward with this. I think it's a very, very great, awesome project. I must recommend on the partnership with, with the OPL, LAC, and the City of Ottawa. And we've always had a partnership. As you know, Mr. Mayor, our partnerships have been really great with Algonquin Spigwak Nagar. And we'd like to continue with that. You know, Chief and Council here supports it right to the end. And 
you know, and, and thanks to Simon, you know, he's been the one that has bringing everybody together and we learn from each other and that's what it's about. We learn, we respect and we trust. Thank you. Well, very well said, um, Della, and also thank you for bringing up the tourism aspect because it brought back memories of Rendezvous Canada and that great uh, trade show uh, that brings people together. And I remember the research was very clear in my old days at the Canadian Tourism Commission that Aboriginal tourism experiences were very high on people's lists when they wanted to come to visit Canada, particularly from, from Europe. So uh, thank you for your input and for your participation. And I know Councillor Luloff has a, has a comment. Della Chimi Minawa. I look forward to our continued partnership founded in this deep respect and trust that we've established between uh, our nations and, uh, and uh, Library and Archives Canada, uh, the city and the OPL. Chimi Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Adela. Now uh, questions to staff. Councillor Gower, please. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask about the value engineering. $100 million through value engineering is a pretty uh, significant amount. Can staff break that down? Um, how was that achieved? Thanks, Councillor, for the question. So the way that, um, so the, the design development happens over multiple years. And one of the things that inevitably happens as a building design evolves is you start with the programming areas and then you put a multiplier on it for um, for the additional spaces required for access and egress. So um, elevators and um, uh, hallways, et cetera. And so what happens is that as the design evolves and you start to fit all those programming pieces together, the building scope ends up increasing. And so every building uh, design since time immemorial, eventually the scope that increases is the square footage. And, and at the end of the day, the fundamental cost of the facility is found in square footage. So the, so the first thing I would say about value engineering is that every time the design iteration came back, the building was bigger than we had originally envisioned. And so we spent a lot of time reconfiguring uh, the programming spaces, looking at the size of hallways and trying to figure out more efficient ways to access, bringing that square footage down. So every time we did that, there were sort of savings associated with that. Um, and then we're talking about material substitutions. As an example, there was a metallic alloy on a large part of the roof surfaces that weren't green. We've changed that to a two-bit uh, ply model. We've, took, we've taken a look at different wood um, species, different stone configurations. So it's, it's, it's not one thing, Councillor. If, if it was one thing, we would talk about that it was a constant uh, reassessment of the size of the facility to bring it down. But it really was sort of a death by a thousand cuts, as it were. Um, but the principal thing I would say about value engineering is that what was first and foremost in our mind was to ensure that the programming of the facility remained intact and that the feedback from the public remained integral to the facility. So we we only made changes that we felt did not affect either one of those things, um, but that kept the, the project, in, in our minds at least, um, that the scope remained as council had initially envisioned. Okay, thanks. That is my concern that that the building in front of us now is substantially the same as what we've been we've been talking about. Um, just on the on the material substitutions, um, should we be concerned about cheaper materials? Uh, would they be less durable? Would they have higher operational implications? Would they need replacement sooner than more expensive materials? Looking down the road. It's, it's a thoughtful question, Councillor, and, and as you can appreciate, and, and Steve in his opening remarks uh, thanked Dan Chenier, um, because he and his team have been important as the design evolved to put be a check against that very question, to ensure that all of our material choices um, consider the long-term implications of the facility. And you can also rest assured that Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada were very focused not only on the durability, but also that the materials were noble, um, that the, as have you seen in the facility, that it's, this is not sort of a run of the mill institution. It really is a beautiful facility. It's architecturally stunning and the materials are appropriate to that. Um, we're talking about a change in materials that, that did not impact either one of those things, Council. With the $16 million transfer from library reserves, are the reserves still healthy and in good shape? 
speaks a dog answer. Uh, I'll ask uh, either treasurers to respond. Morning, Councillor. Thanks for the question. Um, the uh, reserves are in good shape. We have some surpluses from previous years that we'll be leveraging uh, to pay for the library portion of this, as well as a prior commitment from a previous year of a million dollars. Okay, thank you. And last question is, does all of the shifting of funds affect construction or planning on local branch constructions of, of any future library projects? Um, if I could ask Daniel McDonald, CEO of the Ottawa Library, to respond to that. Sure. Um, uh, through the chair, thank you for your question, Councillor. At this point, um, we uh, actually are bringing a report forward tonight and we're looking at our priorities, but uh, we haven't made any changes as such. We have a couple of projects on the go and um, we have the DCs, uh, the funds from what was approved by the board, and we'll work through our process to bring projects forward. Um, so at this point, there's not an immediate impact, but uh, that's just uh, looking at things at this point in time. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tierney, please. Great, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and uh, Simon, the whole crew. It's good to see you guys again. And uh, I know how much work went into getting this across the finish line. Um, so it's very bittersweet because um, of course, we took the extra time, we pumped the brakes, put a jog in the schedule to have that partnership. There was a lot of levers that happened. Uh, all the money that uh, we had saved by doing the partnerships, the, the greening efforts. Uh, I, I don't want people to forget all the work <coughs> that happened on that front. I think that that's the important part there. Uh, but when it comes to the question about cost and I think we're really proud that, you know, we kept saying we're not building the Taj Mahal of the past that was well over 350 million. Uh, how fiscally constrained and, and how we put this deal together. Um, I, I have to ask, the 2016 number that was reflected when it came in 2018 and we voted on it, I, I remember very clearly asking, have we built enough contingency into this project? Uh, COVID aside, that's a totally different kettle of fish. Uh, but did we, at the time, build enough contingency into the cost of construction? I mean, there are multiple types of contingency included in a project estimate. Um, I think that all of the appropriate percentages for contingency were put in place other than on the escalation. As noted in the presentation in the report, we included 10%. Uh, escalation at the time, which reflected the escalation that was observed in the Ottawa market at the time to start of construction. Um, but one of the challenges are, I mean, traditionally, you don't run a design bid build stipulated some project of this magnitude. These are rare. And so that you have to develop and have approved a budget five years before construction starts. And then in between that, you have a worldwide pandemic that is set you know, spiraling implications on labor and and uh, supply chains. Clearly, we did not have sufficient contingency against that escalation. Um, and I, I don't think that there's any reasonable way we could have done that, Councillor. Now, I've run in this on a, a, a local project myself. So I know that there's a lot of truth in the construction costs. Uh, apparently, steel is the new lumber. Uh, it is crazy expensive. And it's driven up a lot of costs on things. Did the bidders indicate, was it a certain, like I'm, what I'm trying to get to is, is it all because of COVID costs that we're seeing all these larger numbers than the 10% that we built in? I apologize for the camera difficulty, Sarah. Maybe just turn the camera off, please. I don't look looking so uh, like that. Anyhow, uh, Chair, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor and, and members of the committee, there, there are significant changes in the construction economy in this region across Ontario and across Canada right now. And that does play itself out into the costs. We're seeing a, a substantial volatility in material supply across the continent. And you might have heard uh, last weekend the U.S. president in, in 
put the port of Los Angeles on 24 hour activity to ensure we get material supplies that come from abroad into North America. So we have volatility in all kinds of individual materials and in a highly specialized building like this, there are lots of materials that are specialized. We also have the double whammy of this, which is the volatility in the availability of highly skilled labor in construction. So, you know, a road project uses general laborers. It uses, it uses locally sourced materials for the most part uh, for construction other than the asphalt itself. So there's less volatility in certain types of construction. But in a building like this, you need skilled tradespeople. You need skilled metal workers, skilled carpenters, uh, skilled mechanical electrical systems. There's all kinds of IT technology in these buildings. And that volatility in the supply of labor is affecting every major construction building construction project in the region right now, and even in Ontario and in many parts of Canada. So this double whammy is being priced as risk into uh, the, any construction bid we received. And that is consistent information we're hearing from all contractors. And just finally on this, we will have seen this as well on the South End Police Station bids as well. So it's not unique to this project. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right. I, I get, you know, during a pandemic, when the feds want to sprinkle a lot of money around, a lot of projects start, supply chain issues happen, and boom, I think that's where we're trapped today. I, I am quite satisfied with the uh, the company that was selected. I, I think they're quite well known. They do quite a bit of work, whether it's on program material, et cetera. Um, uh, one a final question, and it's more about knowing that we'll be tenants for much longer. Uh, are contracts in place or is there going to be some big surprise since we don't own the building anymore and it'd be a much larger number? Uh, I just, I, I want to make sure we really, really don't come back uh, anymore uh, and the board's able to sustain itself as, as it is right now. And I don't know who would answer that. So, Mr. Mayor, I'll take a shot at answering this. So the terms of the agreement between Library and Archives Canada, the City of Ottawa and Ottawa Public Library Board are unchanged. What changed in the timelines is the way or how we are uh, paying the debt over a longer period of time, which the, the Treasurer can say. But we've made no changes to the agreement that, that Council previously approved related okay. to the, the tenancy arrangements. Okay, and I'm, I'm only thinking that because I remember um, the bunker, as we, we call it, uh, was facing some uh, age issues. And uh, if there's any renovations at work that would have to take place now that we're in there over extended time, is that on the current owner or would we have to for fork out some money for that? So Mr. Mayor, on the issue of the bunker facility, you know, we will, and Danielle can, can add to this, you know, we're extending our time in that building uh, where Danielle's team is going uh, to avoid any significant investments in that space um, because we are moving from that space uh, in the long term, because that is how the library board will control its, its uh, operations. And, I, and ultimately the library board will make decisions on that. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the... Great. Thank you, uh, Conseil Fleury, s'il vous plaît. Merci, merci, Monsieur le maire. Puis je vais débuter moi aussi avec euh, des commentaires très positifs euh, au, sujet de, euh, au sujet des efforts. Je pense que plusieurs éléments, l'implication euh, et la participation euh, de la communauté euh, algonquine est, est, est principale. Je pense que les, les composantes environnementales sont aussi très impressionnantes. Puis le partenariat euh, qui a été soulevé. Donc, euh, j'aimerais débuter avec... Euh, des, des notes de, de reconnaissance. J'ai quelques questions, deux qui ont rapport plus avec la programmation euh, de la bibliothèque, puis deux qui ont rapport plus au niveau financier. Um, so, my first question uh, is really in relation to the Seamless. So, we have two organizations who strengthen a partnership. It seems exciting. How will residents or tourists interact in that space so that it's seamless? Like, uh, I know we were talking, you were talking about the strong partnership, but I I didn't hear the, um, you know, uh, res book reservation or, or, or access to uh, space in an equal and open format. So I don't know if that could be uh, described to, to us. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Um, at the outset of the public engagement, one of the things that we asked were, how do the two facilities interact physically within the space? And so, as you may have seen in various presentations on the floor plate, the the library and archives uh, facility is mostly on the western part of the facility and then the OPL is mostly 
on the, sorry, the other way around, Eastern and Western. At the end of the day, the intent is that the interaction be as seamless as possible, accessed in both cases through the atrium and made abundantly clear which is what space, both from a coloring perspective, as well as from a nomenclature and branding perspective. But the intent is that there is a seamless interaction between the two. I know that from a physical perspective, from a catalog perspective, I know there's ongoing discussions between OPL and LAC in terms of how to facilitate ease of access between the two collections. Um, and maybe I'll, um, I'll leave it if anyone from OPL or um, wants to speak to that point, but suffice to say that we've got some years to get that right in terms of how to make as seamless as we can the connections between the two. And there is a lot of focus on that. C'est un édifice complètement intégré et euh, un système complètement intégré. Et maintenant, je tourne la parole à, à, à Daniel à McDonald pour, euh, pour donner plus de spécifiques. Merci. Um, uh, building on what has just been said, what I can tell you is a lot of the work that is to come is about working through how the relationship itself will manifest through, through the building and through the future. Remember when we had the vision for this library, it was about taking the wonderful things that OPL currently offers and could offer along with what LAC offers. And we don't wanna lose that uniqueness that we each bring to the table, but at the same time, we wanna build on those areas where we saw some wonderful opportunities to collaborate. And uh, I know Leslie mentioned so many of them such as the museum grade quality exhibition space, but there's also a thing such as um, genealogy. So in those areas, we will work to make things very seamless, but we will do what we can to make the experience overall in that building one that is welcoming to uh, so many people that we hope will be there. Thank you. I think that's exciting. We've seen the success of that in very different partnerships, but uh, Shankman Center with the MIFO is an example of that, or Arts Court with the Ottawa Art Gallery is an example of different or organizations really being able to work within the these are more than four walls, but you get what I'm saying. Um, the um, the other piece that I, I wanted to maybe is still on programming. So maybe jumping on to what Councillor Gower was saying earlier, you've been able to do a lot of things that have kept the project financially viable and yet achieve its objectives. Um, as part of the consultation or as part of the commitments we've made publicly, is there something we should say to the public at this point in terms of spaces that will not see light of day or that uh, at this point are not included in the project? I don't think so, Councillor. At this point, I would say that all the commitments we've made related to the facility we've kept intact in the design today. One of the things that was very important to the project partners is that the commitments we were making related to the initial design reveal in, uh, in 2019, 2020, uh, right up to the final design that we presented here today, um, doesn't suffer from an effect of high expectations, low delivery. Um, so we believe that the building that the community co-designed with us um, that we showed and got that positive reaction in 2020 is the same design we have today. We've been using our current uh, Ottawa Public Library branches to to showcase and to trial um, some of the amenities uh, that you're that you're speaking about, Councillor Fleury. Things like maker spaces, uh, recording areas uh, that uh, that will all be a part uh, of this new public library. Uh, and and each of these uh, has has been a success. We've trialed them, so we know what to expect when it comes to to users interacting with them. And so uh, all of these uh, that we've that we've been trialing will be uh, a success within this building. And then my final question is maybe more finance related. Um, as part of the breakdown of mitigation efforts, uh, there's a component relating to parking, I think offhand, it's, it's around $10 million. And I guess I, there's two questions to that. How much is in our parking reserves? And then what was the parking increase? Because often we, you know, we, we don't realize how expensive parking gets and how, um, how costly uh, they are. So I, I just wanted a bit more airing of that particular element. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I can chime in on, on that one, on the parking piece. So we, we recently presented to council the update on the annual parking uh, report. Uh, as part of that report, what we indicated was our 
Um, our maximum, we try to keep around 20 million for the parking reserve. We're actually a little over that uh, this year, but we've also provided council with a forecast of about five or six years of uh, upcoming expenses that are aligned with council's priorities that are gonna be uh, consuming in large part uh, those reserves and bringing us closer to the actual minimums that we have uh, that we have in place. And also the additional context that I wanted to provide on parking is that if we go back to when the report was also originally approved, uh, there were discussions at that point around the appropriateness of using parking reserves, given that this facility is really outside of the area where parking reserves were collected. And that's why we've We've also tried to stay away from using parking reserves to uh, to supplement this facility. Okay, so can I get some clarity on on the reference and the recommendation for the ten million? It, we're going to basically get a loan and then through parking revenue paying that back. Is that is that how? That's correct. The, the facility was always the parking element of the facility was always premised being on a on a basis that it would be a cost recovery. Uh, so even with the increased costs, we've ran the analysis and uh, there is still a favorable payback and the facility will still recover uh, its costs through, uh, through parking revenues. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the clarity on that. Could I, my, maybe the, the final touch on that is, so what has been the increase of parking from where we started or where we were at the beginning of the project to the increases that were identified in this report? Are you referring to the number of stalls or the cost of the parking? Cost, yeah, overall cost of the parking structures. So the cost originally was uh, was eighteen million, uh, and now it's twenty eight million. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, I, and I I do uh, I do want to thank the entire team. I, I think it's been a uh, an important project, and and we've all seen the uh, the influence and changes that the Ottawa Art Galleries brought to. Uh, to my area, and I think this is, if not big, I think it's even bigger than than that project. But certainly, uh, really, really showcases uh, the local and, and the national capital pieces very well. So, congratulations uh, all around here. Thank you, Merci Conseil, uh, Vice Chair Dudas, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we've been speaking a lot about you know in increasing our investment in this um, because of the cost overruns. But I wanted to understand, and I, I'm hoping you can lay this out for me a little bit, as to how much we've invested so far, not only in terms of, of financially, but in terms of resources. How much has the city already put in to getting to this point? From a financial perspective, Councillor, as indicated in the presentation, in total, we've expended around 30 million, which is a combination of the early works excavation and site remediation, as well as the design and project management fees, et cetera. Those fees are expended on a 60-40 basis um, between the city and Library and Archives Canada, uh, as per the agreement. So uh, the city has expended you know, around 20 million of that 30 million. Um, not sure exactly what you meant by resources, but happy to clarify if, if that wasn't the answer you were looking for. Well, this has been years in the making and staff have been working behind the scenes to get this going. So there's, there's a dollar attached to that time as well, too. And you might not be able to quantify it, but I, I do actually recall when I was uh, seconded to the library for a short period of time, I had the, uh, the benefit of seeing some of this project launch. The reason why I ask that is because I want, we're talking about um, covering these cost overruns and there's an investment there, but we would also lose that investment that the city has already put into this. But I also understand that we have sold our main branch. So I, I guess my question is, what is the risk if we don't proceed? What are we losing if we were to just turn around and say, we're not proceeding with this project? There's a lot of answers to that, Councillor. I mean, so first we would start with the sunk costs. Um, so that 30 million is unrecoverable. What percentage the city would be on the hook for would be in part to do with how the governance agreement between us and Library and Archives Canada were to manifest, as indicated in the presentation as well, and as understood by Council, we have a legal agreement with Library and Archives Canada to deliver the project. 
by not proceeding, we would be in default of that agreement. And so we would have to explore with legal exactly what the implications of that, but presumably would have some impact on the cost recovery of the 30 million. Um, obviously there, there would be the question and, and Daniel McDonald can speak better to it in terms of what we would do from a central library perspective. How would the OPL board deal with the fact that we would not have a central library? Our lease would expire with our current tenant, uh, with the current landlord, sorry. And then I think finally, um, in terms of what we've invested from getting the public to provide feedback on the project today, this has been two years of the most extensive public consultation done in a building in Canadian history. I think you've heard from our Indigenous partners in terms of the relationships and the partnerships we developed on the facility. It's hard necessarily to say what the sort of quantifiable impact to, the, to our relationships with those communities would be if we were to not proceed. Um, but presumably there would be some impact. And then sort of finally, and I know I said finally before, um, certainly there's a question in terms of our relationship with the contracting community in the city. Um, these, these projects are significant. They, they take significant undertaking from the contracting community to, to respond. And so if we were not to proceed, presumably that would be uh, uh, another challenge in terms of the relationship we have with the contracting community. So there's a massive risk if we do not proceed with this, is what you're, it sounds like you're saying to me. Um, I want to just switch gears. I actually want to I want to hear a little bit more about our return on investments, and by that I mean we've we've seen and we've heard some of this about you know tourism and drawing people. Leslie mentioned it in hers about you know we'll be drawing Canadians and maybe international visitors to the city for this, let alone the benefits to our own residents. Has anybody quantified, um, and maybe it's through other experiences with other new central libraries around the world or Halifax or Calgary, how much money is generated from those tourism visits alone and what the ripple effect could be for our city's economy? Mr. Mayor, if I may go a little bit broader on the question and then get a little narrower closer to what the councillor answered. First and foremost, and I neglected to say this earlier, you know, we're building a new main central library for the citizens of this region. And, you know, we heard through three days of official plan meetings how the city needs to invest in amenities in areas with high intensification. And this uh, lives up to that promise. It's one of the first and major investments we will make that falls into that space. So there is local value, local amenity, real service provided by Danielle and her team to residents of the city. And that's not just about borrowing books. It's about all the other things they are doing these days as well. Uh, when it comes to tourism, I don't think it's possible to put a, a pin in the exact number, but we do know from our counterparts in other cities, uh, Calgary, for example, it became a major draw to the Calgary downtown to have a brand new library. Uh, it was in the, uh, if you haven't been to Calgary, it's on the east side of the downtown area in a derelict area. And it be, has become very much like our edge of La Breton, where it is the, the project that is spurring on investment around it. So there is collateral development in Calgary all around their new library branch, new residential development, new hotels, new other mixed use development. And that is on an economic development, quite a large investment in the Calgary downtown. And then the tourism uh, visitations in Halifax have been quite enormous. And I don't know if uh, Danielle can correct me on the visitor numbers where they are seeing there. Uh, but, you know, for a main library in Halifax, actually becoming one of the main tourist attractions in town with all the competition with the the Blue Nose and the Water and Pier 21 and the other things, it's, it's actually quite impressive and for Halifax to lift that. So I think, you know, we can't put an exact number on it, but the totality of the service and economic value that this project is giving is quite grand. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could just add to what uh, Mr. Willis has said. Um, the Ottawa Public Library did uh, a study on ROI back in 2017, I believe, and we showed that we could almost generate $5 for every dollars in, dollar invested in the Ottawa Public Library. That was not factoring in any kind of construction or any building infrastructure. We, we redid it and we're up to the four, uh, high fours. But the fact of the matter is we currently do provide a good return on investment. And with this facility, I'm confident it will be even better. And as Mr. Willis has indicated, not only in Canada have you seen areas regenerate around library development. 
um, spurning, you know, new restaurants, new uh, museums, new other adjacent uses, housing. Um, but in Europe, when you go, people go and visit libraries. They go there to eat. They go there to experience culture. This is this is very important, and um, there is a return on the investment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Anything else, Councillor? <clears throat> uh, Councillor Deruz, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the presentation and thank you for uh, staff for bringing this forward. I have a couple, a uh, few questions will be, uh, won't be long, but uh, I'm going to ask our treasurer, uh, during COVID, what is the deficit, uh, sorry, what is the surplus of the Arawa Library uh, in 2020? Uh, Councillor, we have um, two surpluses. So from 2021, I believe it was four million, or f excuse me, five million dollars um, that were contributed to reserves to go towards the project. And this year, we're projecting a surplus of four million dollars, which will go towards the project. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tra uh, thank you, Wendy. And my question, my um, reason of my question, uh, during COVID, really, where our residents in the city of Ottawa turned into the library, and they, we saw the demand. Uh, uh, from our resident on on uh, on servicing from the library, and they did an amazing job. But if you look at a, at a bigger scale uh, to our city, it's a major major uh, draw. It's going to be to our city, and I agree with uh, Mr. Willis. You cannot put a dollar sign on when people come uh, from tourism perspective to see the city of Ottawa and a major library. I know Calgary, I know Halifax, uh, and they'll become uh, they'll become a center and they'll become uh, a feature for our city for people to draw from uh, across the country and of course in our in Canada. Uh, um, I have a quick probably a question uh, to uh, to Danielle probably uh, with all this uh, expenses and all what we the project are we taking this is going to impact small project in our community and I'm not being selfish it's just because I know that there is a lot of demand in our library. We have some issue with old aging libraries, specifically in some of them in Metcalf and some other rural area. Can you let me know, give me a little, uh, if this is going to impact those projects in our communities? Thanks for that, George. And just before I pass it over to Danielle, um, I, I'm pleased to let you know uh, that this project and this report uh, will not affect the work on Metcalf branch uh, in, in any way moving forward. Although I do realize that your question is a little bit broader than that. Uh, therefore, I'll ask the CEO to provide a more fulsome, a more fulsome response. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, and through the Mayor, to the Councillor for his question. Um, what I can tell you is, as I said earlier, we have a report before the board tonight to look at all of our facilities. We have some that are in such a stage of works that they will continue. It wouldn't make sense to pull them. Um, and we are looking uh, to develop a facilities master plan that will help guide more of where we're going long term, as you mentioned, looking at aging facilities. So if I don't have that information at this point, that's where we want to go. Um, but those projects that are in the hopper that uh, are so far in the hopper that they need to continue will obviously have to continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Danielle. I appreciate uh, the answer. And Mr. Mayor, I just, uh, I really, uh, if as a homeowner, and if uh, I'm sure most of my colleagues knows that the construction prices, everything went up. So I understand the challenges that we have ahead of us and we already, we've been investing so much money and we already brought the community and a stakeholder multiple time on public consultation. Mm -hmm. And for the project uh, like that, mm -hmm. I understand the challenges we have. So I will be supporting the report coming from the RO Library. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you very much, uh, George, Councillor Glarus. Uh, Councillor uh, Meehan, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, very interesting conversation. Um, I just, I'd like to say before I ask my questions that I am on library board, and um, I too recognize uh, the benefits of having this amazing partnership go ahead in the city of Ottawa. Um, that being said, um, there, I think we have to ask also some very serious questions about 
um, these escalating costs. And I, I, I apologize, I missed the presentation at the beginning of this meeting, but could I just verify that um, our total original estimate of 192.9 million is now 334.16 million? Is that in fact, are those the most accurate figures that we have? Could I ask, is that, is that accurate? So it's accurate in terms of a total authority perspective. What we tried to make clear in the presentation in the council report is that it's not apples to apples because of the addition of net zero carbon and the increase of the Library and Archives Canada contribution to the project. So the what we would what we have suggested the focus would be is the initial contribution of 104 million from the city and OPL versus 168 million, which is what we're asking for today. So a net add of 64 million. And that uh, overall, is that still about a 73% increase on the project cost? It's around a 60% increase on uh, from the 104 to the 160. Okay. And uh, I think uh, the treasurer said that uh, um, we're, we're taking a great deal of uh, How much actually are we taking from the library reserves at this point? Uh, in accordance with the report, there's $17 million that are tagged from reserves. A good portion of that is coming from the surplus from 2020 and 21, as well as um, a contribution from the library and a significant fundraising campaign. So what does that leave our reserves then, Ms. Stephenson? Um, there would be, a, I believe, a small amount of about $3 million left in the reserves, Councillor Meehan. So, okay, that, so we're taking oh, a significant chunk. And um, our head of our library board, uh, Danielle, you said that you don't think, I'm trying to find what you actually said, that um, that'll mean new changes to our libraries. And, and I, I would like to reiterate, just like, to, like Councillor DeRue's, um, I have a new library scheduled for Riverside South. So I, I, I realize that we're gonna have a report, facilities report tonight, um, but uh, how do I, how do I, this is an important issue for, for my residents. What do I tell them? I mean, it's not for certain that this big expenditure is going to not impact what's gonna happen in my community. What do I tell them? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to answer the question. Um, so first of all, uh, if we weren't in this situation today, your project would be uh, progressing as it is, and it has to come forward to the board uh, with a report explaining what the total cost of ownership is for that project. That was approved by the board as part of our financial framework. So that is the process any project would go through, and yours is slated to come forward uh, in Q2 of next year. I believe that's what was said in the facilities report. So uh, it comes forward and we will look at all the costs because as you know, they're not just capital costs, they're operating costs to put into libraries. And our goal is to have the board see the total picture. You, this, your project is funded through DCs. Those DCs exist there now. I have to ask, I mean, if I was, uh, I was facing a 60% increase in something I really, really, really wanted. And this is, I know this library is something we really, really, really want and we really, really, really need. Still, I would have to ask myself what the long-term cost to, to borrow and to, to pay for this additional, what are the long-term borrowing costs for the library, this, this new library? So uh, we're taking advantage of the low interest rates and the fact that we have debt maturing between now and 2026. So the timing of the project lines up with some of the debt that's already maturing. So we're not adding any new additional debt. We're replacing with actually older, um, more expensive debt um, that is retiring. And we have not increased the overall debt servicing amount that was originally approved because we're extending the term of the, the loan from 20 to 40 years. So overall, it's actually costing us less by extending it out when you look at the time value of money. So what is the amount then? What is what? So the what is, additional so the additional amount of, for the city debt is thirty six million, and the debt servicing associated with that is ninety seven. But the net present value of that over forty years is twenty two. So twenty two versus the thirty five of debt is actually uh, cheaper overall because the interest rates are so low, and we've extended the debt to match the life of the asset. 
Okay, that's clear, not really. Um, it's gonna cost us more. That's the bottom line, a lot more. We're, we're issuing $36 million in additional debt, but we've got a financial strategy to make it affordable with an existing debt servicing amounts retiring debt and matching it to the life of the asset. So, but can you say how much a 60% escalation in cost of this library and what we are as a city paying is going to cost overall? The Seven. lifetime cost of servicing this debt, can you say that? So the overall cost of the um, debt? Mm -hmm. So that's, so I mean, the, the overall, uh, yeah. so we're adding an additional 36 million in debt. Mm -hmm. um, the total debt is 99 million. Okay. Uh, but the net present value of that is 83. So we're like, by issuing debt, it's an efficient way of raising these funds. So the overall increase is what Simon described is that 64 million. And, and the financing strategy does not add any additional financial pressure. I just looking for a total, what this is going to cost us over 40 years. It, uh, Simon described the cost as 168 million additional. Okay. Okay. Oh, I won't believe that anymore. Have we asked the federal government if they can load us this additional money? We are in partners with the federal government. There's only one taxpayer, it's you and me. Councillor, um, I think as the deputy treasurer advised, you know, the city has a, a preferential access to debt. I'm not really sure unless the federal government were to give a zero interest loan, which I'm not sure there's much precedent for that, um, that, that that would be advantageous in pulling together the total funds for the project. But have we asked? Uh, no. Why don't we ask? That, that would take a, a resolution of council to make the request to the federal government to lend us the funds. Um, but I think as the deputy treasurer indicated, um, going out to the debt markets as the municipality is a very efficient way of securing the funds. Um, but obviously it would be at council's discretion. Well, I, I would certainly support uh, a direction to council to do that um, if it can save us. I mean, uh, this is obviously, I know we've made an initial investment of $30 million, um, but this is a partnership with the feds and I'm sure they don't want to see this project uh, put on the shelf right now either. Um, I, I would suggest that we should be asking uh, for them to, uh, to uh, Finance. Also, Mr. Barry, Mr. Mayor, if I may respond, uh, the city is in the process of asking the federal government for a whole range of investments inside Ottawa right now. We are submitting multiple applications for financing through various stimulus packages. We're getting very advantageous contributions and infrastructure projects in virtually every ward of the city through a variety of programs. And we are, uh, council has already directed the mayor to ask the government of Canada and the province of Ontario to pick up the entire tab of stage of phase stage three of LRT, which would be the city's top priority for a federal ask right now, unless council changes his mind. So uh, when it comes to libraries and community facilities, there is no program federally. There is nothing that we could ask them to cover this under. There is, we search for these programs all the time and apply whenever we can. So there's no vehicle for that. But as I said, the city's top priority and asks right now for financial support is actually, uh, as the mayor has already asked the senior Galveston of government on is on stage three. So as I said, the treasurer has already indicated that we are, we, we are taking advantage of very advantageous interest rates right now within the city's own borrowing powers and not prejudicing our own ability to borrow. Uh, as And I, I, I'm out of my league to, to talk in the treasurer's place on this, but I, I think that context needs to be part of the conversation. Okay, I thank you, um, Mr. Willis. I appreciate that. Um, just one more last question. I mean, I don't think anyone's talking about canceling this project. Uh, 
but it, would it not be a good idea maybe to delay it slightly until the the escalating costs of material and you know this is we're blaming COVID for this um, can we not delay it slightly so until some of the costs come down two things I would say about that counselor the first is that we have a bid validity period from PCL that expires on November 8th so in effect, delaying it beyond November 8th would be canceling the existing procurement or be open to whatever PCL were to add to the costs associated with ongoing inflation. The second thing I'd say is that, you know, our quantity surveyor does not indicate any expectation that the forces in the market that we're observing right now are likely to mitigate it in any significant fashion. So any delay on the project would suffer from additional escalation in inflation. I've heard those arguments before on a different topic, but, but I, I want to thank you for uh, your information and um, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Hey, Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning to you and colleagues. Um, can I have a better understanding why Fedco gets to decide how to spend the library's reserves before the library board has had a chance to discuss this matter? Wendy? Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor, for the question. Um, and it, it's a good one, Councillor. Uh, the first portion of the surplus for 2020 uh, did go to the Library Board, as I understand. So that decision was made um, to uh, put the money aside to cover um, some costs or make an additional contribution to this. Our recommendation is um, similar in terms of the surplus that's expected uh, for this year. And that will be part of the discussion that happens at the Board as well this evening. And I'll just ask my colleague, Danielle, if she has anything further to add to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, responding to uh, the councillor. Um, councillor, I think you'll know that uh, we've included a copy of the uh, reserve bylaw in the report tonight uh, due to another, I can't remember which report it's attached to, but we have provided it. And um, it's my understanding, uh, and I believe you were with me when we met with the city solicitor, that the reserve bylaw is ultimately controlled by the city. Uh, the board, like we do with the budget, makes a recommendation to city council and city council has the ultimate authority. Um, and this project, as was um, approved through the 28 report, uh, 2018 report, sorry, that went to board and council, um, where it was agreed that um, the project management office would be governed by the city. So that is my understanding why we have taken the legislative process that we have. Hopefully that answers your question. So you support Fedco making a decision on how to spend the library's reserves and DC revenues in reserves. Is that what you're saying? We, if I've heard the treasurer correctly, we are anticipating a $4 million surplus. The library is anticipating a 4 million surplus at the end of 2021. And as the CEO, you've okayed how to spend those reserves before even talking with your board of trustees. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Um, no, what I am putting forward is a staff recommendation as part of a team that pulled together a financial plan, and that is going before the board, and the board has the opportunity to discuss that tonight and make their decision. But we're at Fedco. Fedco has a recommendation, if passed, goes to council. It doesn't go to the library board. If Fedco makes a decision today, it goes to council. So what if Fedco approves this motion today? and the library board doesn't, what happens? I'm understanding that as per previous practice, our report before went directly to council. Council receives our report and I, they will do what they do with whatever Fedco decides today. And um, the board will put forward its recommendations to city council, that is our path. So it's possible when this matter goes to city council, there could be a recommendation from Fedco that's different than a recommendation from the library board. Is that correct? That's a possibility, yes. Okay, fair enough. 
Okay, just on the matter of uh, the cost overruns, Mr. Dupuy did, and I, I apologize, I was not able to make the presentation. So when you make the presentation available to council, I will read through it. Um, were you able to find efficiencies at all, or is the uh, total net cost increase only being absorbed by debt reserves, the DC reserves? Thank you, Councillor. As outlined in the report and the presentation, through the two-year design process, we managed to uh, find around 100 million in efficiencies. Um, as indicated in the presentation, the intent of uh, pushing on those efficiencies was to ensure that this that the project's budget was not affected by scope creep, but it was simply um, as a result of COVID-19 and the market forces being brought to bear in the Ottawa region. But since the quote from, I think you said that the company's PCL came in, no additional efficiencies have been found. Is that correct? Uh, no, Councillor. We have been uh, undertaking a detailed value engineering um, process with PCL, and there are a couple of million dollars worth of efficiencies that we found today. As you can appreciate, we have a very limited window and um, large changes have big impacts on the facility. So we're looking at opportunities where it's truly, and I think you use the right word, efficiencies as opposed to cutting any aspects of the facility. Uh, and we have been able to find a couple of million today. Well, my next question is about a cut and that's the parking garage. I was not a fan of the parking garage when this is, was discussed by council last term of, of council. This is a facility that's gonna be right on the LRT. I do acknowledge there is a demand for parking. I do think there should be parking available at the site, but I'm troubled by a $28 million price tag for underground parking. My understanding is there is no branch within the city of Ottawa that has any underground parking. It's all surface parking. Um, it's that balance, right? Um, the cost and expense, I don't believe the cost of the parking garage will ever be uh, earned back through parking revenues. I just don't see that when it's gonna be split between the LAC and, and the city of Ottawa. Um, my understanding through a line of questioning by Councillor Meehan is we're, we're at a point, or maybe Councillor Dudas, we're at a point where we can't make this significant change without impacting this project without going back to square one and, and that we have sunk costs and that the anticipated cost of starting over would actually be more expensive than if we were just to swallow this and just continue uh, going forward. So can I just have a comment on that, please? Mr. Mayor, first of all, the parking garage is the underlying structure to the main building. So you could eliminate parking, but you wouldn't eliminate all of the structural components that hold the building up off the ground. So there is no you know, grand net savings of $28 million if we remove the parking. And this was a matter debated considerably at council when we got the original approval. Parking will pay for itself. Parking is not there for library employees. It is a paid recovery parking program run by the city, and it will recover its costs. That's part of the financial financial uh, plan in front of us today, and it is for people who are visiting. And yes, it's unusual that uh, we would have paid parking uh, at a library, but that's not actually that unusual because the main branch of the library today has no parking, and anybody visiting and taking a car needs to pay one of the private parking garages in the immediate vicinity, such as the World Exchange Center. So in this situation, we're capturing revenues, for example, the World Exchange Center gets for people who visit our facility, and we're capturing them ourselves to use to pay for our own building and we will be in time paying back that garage through parking revenues and that's the point mr gantian made in his presentation earlier thank you i guess to close my issue i um i don't fault staff for the construction inflation that we're seeing i think that's very difficult to factor in particularly over some of the uh significant shocks that we're seeing lately um i do have a problem with the library board not having this discussion first. We as a library board need to discuss what all the other competing priorities for reserves is and make a decision as a board. There are other priorities. I also acknowledge the board has identified the shared site as a key priority overall. So there's that, that balance as well. Um, but certainly the public was shocked at the increase of the price 
And I think that there is a financial plan. I think there's a reasonable financial plan to finance this. But my issue is with how the library is contributing and how we might be shortchanging ourselves for other library projects. That's what my concern is at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elshantiri, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, question, I, 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 first of all, someone like myself been around for a long time. I can really appreciate this move today. It's been a long time. Go back to Councillor Harder when she was the chair and then Councillor Turney and now uh, Lulav. And to see it happening now is a good news story. But I think the, the misunderstanding is between the DC development charges, where does it go and uh, tax supported? And I mean, we have so many questions and I, my colleague did a great job trying to, and Danielle, uh, she tried to explain it, but it seemed it should be a memo from the treasurer to council explaining, you know, the funding different, obviously between DC and uh, tax support, because it seems a lot of question about this, especially uh, local council with the project uh, of library, they think that's gonna, uh, that's gonna be jump queues or something like this. So if that could be explained, that would be great. But I have a question for the treasurer. And, and Ms. Stephenson, I know we're gonna borrow uh, some money. And, and I think I ask you that question every time we borrow money. What percentage are we in comparison to other municipality in Ontario, you know, of our pretty much close to our size, the percentage of borrow. Like, I mean, I know we are a certain percentage, but we have the capacity to go to probably 25, but I'd like to explain that to us, please. Well, thanks very much, Councillor, for the question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the report speaks to our uh, council cap in terms of borrowing, which is 7.5%. And the funding strategy that you have in, in place and in front of you today with respect to the library does not exceed that cap. In fact, um, what we're going to do is just leverage debt that's retiring over the next couple of years and, and basically um, leverage that room to be able to finance the incremental piece for this project. So there's no change whatsoever. Um, the overall cap in the province of Ontario is set at 25%. Our cap here um, in the city of Ottawa as approved by council is uh, 7.5. So we're significantly below that. I can tell you based on my regular interactions with treasurers across Ontario, uh, some are close to that cap, the provincial cap of 25%. And in fact, I'm aware of one regional government that's above that. So um, we're trending very well in that regard. And, and I think that's good information, uh, Mr. Mayor, to have from the treasurer. And because with that question, it's always asked, you know, we, we borrow money, where are we in the borrowing and all this? My other question is to Mr. Willis. And Mr. Willis, we heard uh, during the three days celebration is about our development charge. So. Is it fair to say after we uh, adopt and approve the OP, the developing charge will be come forward and with some different recommendation because we heard we might be one of the lowest uh, in the province if it's not uh, somewhere else. Can you shed a little bit of light on a development charge review? So Mr. Mayor, our current uh, bylaw was adopted in 2019 and it needs renewal by 2024. Council can change it at any point between now and 2024 if it wishes, but staff uh, are recommending that we review it once we have the updated infrastructure master plan and transportation master plan. And at that time, we'll add up the to co total cost of all the facilities planned in the parks and rec master plan, affordable housing projects, the like, and we'll do a recalculation of, of the rates. I, I often say uh, the development charges Act in Ontario is all about math. So we take the total cost of all of our projects. We attribute what portion of the projects are actually attributable to the growth in population because you can't use development charges for things for the existing population. You can only use it for growth. And then we uh, calculate the number of units to be built and we apply it all out based on that. So there will be a review of the bylaw. And in the next term of council, I intend to bring a policy report fairly early in the new term of council to get some direction from council on its approach on the development charges bylaw. 
Oh, thank you for that, Mr. Wallace. I'm looking forward to 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 that debate. But you know, I find it a little bit uh, surprising when when you know when when some of us surprised for the price of lumber or construction or material uh, gone up. So I think any one of us who even try to go to a local lumber store would know how much that price has changed in the last few years because of the pandemic. So uh, I, I believe uh, Mr. Library Chair and Danielle Maybe a memo from you explaining, the, you know, the funding formula. This will not have an impact on a DC project. I think that goes a long way as a recommendation. It's up to you what you do, but I, I would recommend we should send that out to our colleagues. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Deans, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have a number of questions. I guess the first one is about the type tight timeline for. Um, the library board and committee and council to make this decision. I mean, we heard uh, in an answer to one of my colleagues' questions that we have to um, agree by November the 8th or we would risk uh, losing the agreement that we have today. But I've been hearing about this for weeks now around the city. So why has it, why, why is it just landing so late? I always feel, um, that we end up in a position where we don't have uh, enough time to uh, consider all of these things. And so I just wonder, why didn't this come sooner? I'd be happy to start the answer to that question and pass it over to, to Mr. Willis. Thanks for it, uh, Councillor Deans. You know, we are operating under extremely tight timelines during the approval of the OP and during the budget process. And in a perfect world, we would have had a week or two in between each meeting. But with the bid price that holds only until November 9th, this was the best that we could do. We had 90 days, or sorry, 60 days to evaluate the bids. There's a lot of confirmation that has to happen before we can come back to council um, and the board with a final number. Um, so I'll turn it over to, uh, to, to Mr. Willis. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Library Board Chair. Uh, that's quite correct. So this is the standard city tender process standard length of time and any contractor puts in their bid and says it's only valid for a certain number of days and if it drags on that bid is no longer valid that's standard for all design bid build projects that we have in the city of ottawa we use the time the first couple of weeks within the time to do as simon indicated a deep dive review in terms of the, assuring that the bid was correct and met the city's performance requirements we worked with the contractor to find additional savings uh, within the design such with through the substitution materials without effect in the program that takes time and then we needed to generate the report to council and to the library board check the governance order of operations with the city clerk's office get the material out and notifications with council it is it is a function of the length of time of our our bid validity period in all of our standard contracts and if if council feels we don't have enough time then that's something we have to look at at a procurement level um, globally uh, for the city as well. This is a complicated project. A lot of our standard construction projects like a sewer replacement are a lot more straightforward. Um, again, we don't build libraries like this all the time. Thank you for that. But, but uh, I was given to understand that it was originally slated to um, come through the committee process a couple a few weeks back. So why the delay? So Mr. Mayor, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do the negotiations for some of the savings we did find. Uh, we needed that time to have those conversations with the contractor and we did find some savings. And I believe it was about a billion and a half in additional savings we found just checking with Simon here. So we're trying to find every dollar we can recognizing the significance of what we're putting before council today. You know, we're uncomfortable with this this increase in budget it is a global pandemic that we can't control but we still wanted to use every lever we could to bring this project uh in every savings we could find and that's what the time we needed okay thank you for that um i mean i re recognize that we're in a global pandemic and there's rapidly escalating costs and unfortunately we we can't really control those so i know this is a tough situation it's especially made tough by having already sold the existing library branch and i get that but the other part for me and i know we're way down the pipe on this project and i understand that but the other part for me is the other thing that pandemic is probably doing is delivering a glut of current 
office space in the downtown core, because it is quite probable that not everyone will be returning to their workspaces as they have in the past. And I wonder if with a glut of uh, office capacity in the downtown core, if those prices wouldn't actually be falling and if there might be, I know it's late in the process, I, I understand that, but is it something that we've at least given an initial look at or thought about that maybe there would be a bargain in the downtown core, perhaps even in a better location with all of the office space we expect to be vacated in, in, you know, in the not too distant future. So first of all, Mr. Marin, we'll be reporting this through FedCo later on. It's surprising in Ottawa. Ottawa is one of the fastest recovering economies in all of Canada, and very few tenants are giving up their space in the downtown core. Uh, they're still holding on. They're not. It's not yet on the market. If it's going to come on the market, it may be a year or two before we even see it, because getting out of a lease is actually extremely expensive for anybody. So you have to. They always have to do the calculations about whether it's better to hold on to the end of the lease and question rather to renew. So there is no big block of space in the downtown core that's readily available uh, that we could just pounce on uh, in a situation like this. Uh, the other the other issue is, is that, you know, there are all the other costs that Simon mentioned because we have obligations to Library and Archives Canada. There's the move, the, the costs of moving and setting up an interim branch. There, there are the, the, co the cost implications of an interim solution grow and grow. And every year we delay doing this project, say we put it on hold and try it again in two years, there's no guarantee the prices will be any cheaper. Natural inflation would come into play in the meantime. And at this stage, you know, every year we wait, even in normal inflation at 3%, 4%, 6%, which is the normal range when we're not in a pandemic, that's a very large dollar value. So, if you're, so the next council would be faced with an even more expensive project if we waited. We'd have the interim costs and the higher construction costs. So, you know, it, 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 we acknowledge this is a very difficult conversation with council right now, and we, we acknowledge council's put in a difficult position to make a commitment to continue with this project, but we see no path where this becomes a cheaper project by waiting. Okay, but you have taken an initial look at the potential for office space and there is none. So, Chair, so uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the obvious place we went to was we examined the possibility of extending our, our existing lease within the existing building, because that would be the cheapest because there'd be no moving costs attached to that. And um, as I said, just the annual lease costs alone with all of the cancellation costs, delay costs, inflation costs, we looked at all that. And again, that's not we didn't feel that was responsible to bring that to council because it's not a cheaper option than proceeding. Well, thank you. Um, there was a reference to uh, uh, the need to do aggressive fundraising and I'm wondering how realistic aggressive fundraising is right now, because I've been hearing that uh, fundraising uh, groups are really struggling through this pandemic with their fundraising endeavors. So uh, how realistic is building that into this uh, proposal? I can confirm that it is a very bold amount that we're looking uh, to fundraise for, that we have a very good team in place and quite, and, and, and honestly, if, uh, uh, looking back at the at the board minutes uh, from from our last board, we have actually received a uh, an anonymous donation of one million dollars already towards the project. Fundraising efforts have been going quite well. Uh, Danielle, if you wanted to give a further update to that. Yes, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was envisioned early on in the project. This is not something that has just come and reared its head today. Uh, we commissioned a study in 2018 to look at that and look at it in the environment, um, contemplating a new hospital and so on. The firm KCI recommended that OPL could raise um, $10 million with an additional $5 million for an aspirational goal and a total of 15. And they did not recommend that it was necessarily um, based on interviews. A best for bricks and mortar, but based on furniture, fixture and equipment, they felt that these kinds of fundraising um, endeavors would in fact be fine. So the 7 million is clearly under the 10 that was provided. Uh, I do think it's an aggressive goal. Uh, we have a couple of years to do it, which is, is the good thing. And as the chair has indicated, we have a team in place and we've put an additional note in our report to keep an eye on it by having uh, our board look at uh, twice uh, reports twice a year on the progress. And then if we have to, we'll adjust at that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I, I mean, I do think it's an aggressive 
goal given, uh, you know, when you were looking at, our, at that originally, it was pre-pandemic and now we're in a pandemic and a lot has changed. So I'm not sure that's realistic anymore. And I guess I would just like to know if that doesn't materialize, how is that, a, uh, how are those additional funds going to be found? Um, through you again, Mr. Mayor, uh, I think at this point, we'd have to go back and look at what we've got available as, as our budgets go forward. Um, you know, it's still early days and um, we have been able to raise funds in a pandemic and I feel we have to give it a try. It was envisioned in earlier versions of the report that were approved by the board and council that there would be an expectation for OPL to fundraise. I can also tell you that other libraries have had that pressure put upon them. Um, uh, Halifax had a fundraising component, so did Calgary, and they were in different times of economic uh, distress and they were still able to raise some funds. So at this point, um, that's what I can advise. Our fundraising goal, while ambitious, is realistic. We have an incredible team of fundraisers uh, in place that are already hard at work, led by our honorary chair, the Right Honourable Beverly McLaughlin. We do believe that we are going to be achieving this goal, uh, and we look forward to the continued work of our fundraising team that has so far done an incredible job. Okay, thank you for that. My final question is about the impact on the city's um, credit rating. I'm wondering if the issuance of this new debt has the potential to change our credit rating. Uh, thanks, Councillor, for the question. Uh, a good question. Um, in my opinion, no, uh, there's no impact that we will see with respect to our credit rating. We're well within our borrowing limits, both provincially and those set by city council. Uh, and basically what we're doing in terms of the funding strategy is as debt retires, um, we're issuing the new debt to cover that space. So there really should be no change. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor McKinney, please. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I apologize for uh, being late to, to the meeting. Um, I had something else on, but so if this question has already been asked, but uh, I know that the, uh, uh, the current building has been sold. Uh, is there a plan if, you know, if the library is late by six months, a year, a couple of years, is there a plan for maintaining uh, library services in uh, the downtown of the city? In so, the Mr. Mayor, so Mr. Mayor, I'll start and Danielle might wish to add to what I would, would add. Um, first of all, we, we will maintain a good line of communications with our landlord. Um, that's a very unusual building, not an easy building to lease out to anyone else. And I'm sure the landlord it will ultimately have to spend a fair bit of money once the library moves out to bring another use into that space. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I think it's reasonable to expect that if we needed an additional time as a result of construction delays, which we will monitor very carefully, that, that we could have a very... Um, cordial conversation with the landlord to, to continue operations in the existing facility. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add to that? Uh, I've talked about it at a high level. At this point, um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna add anything more because I think the plan is that we have a timeline in place. We've uh, negotiate, we are hopefully negotiating with the, the builder to get this project in place. And um, obviously, uh, we can look at a plan if that's what's needed, but uh, I honestly don't have a plan at this point to extend it other than what you have suggested that we would look at our existing facility because it needs to be clear that um, you just can't move a library with the weight of the books and the structural needs into any other facility. So I believe the current facility is, is where we would have to look at any kind of interim efforts first. And Mr. Mayor, I apologize. I, I didn't say earlier, and it was advised while, while Danielle was talking, we actually, within our existing lease, have a right to extend within the existing lease. It'll be a higher rate of rent than we pay now, but we have a right to extend. Okay, thank you for that. I know that when the location was um, decided on by council, the mayor had actually asked uh, the chair at the time, uh, Councillor Tierney, um, to um, look at um, possible options for uh, a localized 
um, library in the uh, in center town. Um, so I just wonder if if any of that has has occurred uh, at this time. If you could just give us a quick update on what that might look like, because that could be a solution if, in fact, uh, we have a, a central library uh, shut down for any period of time. That is an excellent question, Councillor. And we are about to undergo a facilities master plan that will be looking at at communities. Uh, and how we are serving them, which communities are overserved, which communities are underserved. Um, so it would be difficult um, to, to answer uh, your question prior to that analysis being done. Uh, but that is absolutely, um, that will absolutely be something that, uh, that will be considered, uh, Danielle. Yes, I, I don't have anything further to add other than it was agreed that uh, that would be looked at potentially as well as part of the next background study. So um, the facilities master plan, in my view, is the best way to uh, to review that. It's not been forgotten. Okay. And that, that will occur in this interim period of time then? We are hoping to, uh, tonight we have a report on to start some of the pieces of the facilities master plan. So it's something we need and, and we're hoping to get done as soon as we can, Councillor. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so on the, the the library and where we're at today, and, and you know, it is obviously, um, we're, we're well down the road and we want to see uh, a library established. This is the location. Uh, work has been done. Uh, there's um, you know, 30 million and already sunk costs. So um, I wonder though, if any thought um, has been given, uh, especially given the circumstances that, that we find ourselves in today uh, by the library board. And it's certainly a conversation that council has to have about uh, amending it and providing housing, perhaps, you know, looking at the air rights. Um, um, you know, it would have been ideal to have, you know, a, a wonderful mixed income community built above our central library that could be incorporated into um, a library at this location. I mean, this location we knew, and I'm, I'm not going back to debate the, the location, believe me. Uh, but it wasn't where most people live. There's few people live uh, in that location. Um, few people visit. Um, you know, it's just it's not that it's not the commercial core of of the city. So, uh, you know, the more we can do to have people living in the area and uh, and to support uh, our need for housing, especially affordable housing, uh, with our own uh, infrastructure. Uh, certainly would meet so many of the uh, goals that we've established as a city and uh, responsibilities really as we have as a, as a city to house people. So I wonder if any, you know, are we like opening that door and looking in and saying, you know, maybe this is a way that we could um, help fund uh, a library while at the same time uh, housing people and, and building you know, a good mixed income community above uh, above our library and near our LRT. So Kelly, can I ask you to put the presentation back up to answer Councillor McKinney's question? Because a lot of what she said about a mixed income community around the library, absolutely agree with the councillor on. And that's absolutely what we're going to get through a series of different moves. And it'd be easiest if I could show one slide from the presentation. I know Councillor McKinney wasn't in the room when I delivered earlier. Um, I wonder if it's possible to get the staff presentation back up. So it's about the fifth slide in, you see the picture of the library with the, the ghosted uh, facilities. Um, back a few slides, a few more, a few more, one more, this one, thank you. And nope, back ahead again, one, there we are. So Councillor, uh, in principle, what you said about a mixed community living in close to the library and participating with it is exactly what we're trying to accomplish. So if you look at this in the street, in the, so the very far side of this slide is Bronson Avenue. I know the council knows the site well, but I'm gonna just do for the benefit of other people. We have the library, which is the building shown in color. The, there is a building ghosted in next to it. Uh, it's a lower, it's a lower tall uh, building. That is a city owned site. We're going to use it for the construction staging for the library and council has already designated after the construction is done, that is a dedicated affordable housing site. 
that we will deliver in partnership with uh, through a process that our my colleagues at Community Social Services and Real Estate will run to bring an affordable housing project. Furthermore, on the left side of the screen, that's a, an image done from the zoning. If you recall from the escarpment district zoning, we talked about this before, it may not look exactly like this, but that site is the site owned by the National Capital Commission. And then NCC has a proposal call on the street. Matter of fact, they've received the proposals. Their board will vote in, if the mayor can correct me wrong, I believe it's January or February on the winning vote for that. And the NCC has put affordable housing requirements in their bid uh, for a mixed use development project on that site, which is immediately adjacent to Pemmacy Station. So in its totality, I hope we will see with the accumulation of all these projects exactly what the councillor is asking for. Um, redesigning the library, putting bill, uh, air rights above, that would be something that uh, is uh, not beneficial to the project today and the delays itself would just undermine anything we would get from air rights. Um, if the councillor wants to sit and have a conversation about raising the height of the building next to the library through the zoning, I'm happy to talk to the councillor and we can bring that forward through council if it wishes to get more capacity out of the site we own. And yet yeah, we'll wait and see what the NCC will have out of their proposal as well. So as I said, Mr. Mayor, fundamentally the council points valid we want that type of mixed community that's exactly what we're trying to do with the totality of everything happening on this block thank you for that and i and i did miss the the um the slideshow and obviously i'm aware of the the zoning that's going in and what's going in in and around but um i won't belabor it but just to say that again i go back to i think that you know perhaps it needed to be done at the beginning perhaps it's a lesson learned perhaps it's a lesson to learn uh, but having housing above any of our infrastructure really is, uh, I think, the uh, the way to go in the future. Um, and uh, you know, I, th I still think that it could help pay for uh, some of the uh, the debt that we're going to incur. So I will leave it at that. But I am always happy to have a conversation about how we can build more affordable housing in the area, even with higher uh, higher building heights. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, anyone else before uh, Councillor Luloff as chair wraps up? Councillor Luloff, please. Thank you so much, colleagues, uh, for this uh, discussion today. Uh, I think you can see that we have an amazing design and we've secured a fantastic partner in Library and Archives Canada. And we've been privileged to build meaningful relations with the Indigenous community. This isn't just a building. It's an opportunity to build a library that this city can be proud of. We are going to get so much more out of this than we're putting into it. Let me quickly clarify something that came out in the questions to staff. This report says that we will continue to look for other sources of funding. This information is in the report. We know that often the provincial government matches funding of the federal government on projects of this magnitude. This is an avenue that the CEO and I have been pursuing. I'd also ask any councillors considering a change in location at the 11th hour and 59th minute to consider what that would mean to our incredible partnership with Indigenous partners and all the work that we've put in together. I also appreciate the tough questions asked by my colleagues. Good policy, however difficult the current situation, will always stand up to scrutiny. This is good policy, a sound financial plan, and an excellent project. Adesoke is the single largest social infrastructure investment in this city's history. Libraries are critical to the health, well-being, vibrancy, and the wealth of a community. Central libraries are popular, must-see tourist destinations for the cities that they call home. And on opening day, Adesoke will be the largest non-federal tourist destination in Ottawa and one of the most visited buildings in Canada, with more than 1.5 million visitors expected annually. Unprecedented and meaningful public consultation and Indigenous engagement have resulted in this unique and striking design for the facility, befitting a G7 capital. It is a once-in-a-lifetime new build in the National Parliamentary District, where everyone, regardless of status, will be able to enjoy world-class collections, programming, spaces, and architecture. This is the first central library to achieve net zero carbon and will help us achieve our goal of transitioning Ottawa into a clean, renewable, and resilient city by 2050. Our design incorporates recommendations for accessibility, inclusivity, sustainability, and Indigenous representation. This is the central library that Ottawa residents have asked for through consultation and deserve. Libraries are for everyone, free of charge. 
the spaces, tools, books, technologies, programs, and supports that they need to learn, connect with others, develop language skills, and stay informed and be connected to their heritage and language that were spoken in the past and should be spoken today. Libraries provide safe spaces for everyone to use, including vulnerable members of our community. They provide access to Wi-Fi and public computers to do essential work like applying for a job, preparing resumes, and participating in homework clubs. These are the living rooms of our communities. And Atasoke will be home to collections and genealogical records, and it will offer visitors an opportunity to take out instruments and record music, provide space for performances and traditional gatherings, and be a place where visitors can come together to discover, learn, and create. To the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation partners from Kirigan Zibi and Pigwagnagan, Chimigwech, Danielle, Leslie, Craig, Simon, Steve, Wendy, Isabel, Tim, Jan, and former member, a former uh, member of parliament and minister McKenna, and all trustees past and present that have worked on this project. Thank you. Let's be a part of something bigger than ourselves today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That was really well said, uh, Councillor Luloff. And I would encourage, um, if we're able to, Mr. Uh, Willis, to make sure that those members who are not able to see the presentation are sent the hard copy. I think um, that plus, um, if possible, the uh, recording of uh, Leslie and our two uh, leaders from the Algonquin community, because they were very, very powerful messages. Today, we're tasked with ensuring the future of an important city building initiative the Adusake Library, an initiative that will finally kickstart redevelopment of a key downtown uh, area of our city. C'est une initiative qui le relance en fin de secteur clé dans le centre ville d'Ottawa. Now, since the eviction of the 1960s of La Breton Flats, the NCC has attempted to develop that site into a vibrant, uh, livable neighborhood, but without much success. 60 years later, the city, with the city finally taking the reins, a clear vision and plan has emerged to transform Le Breton Flats. Adesake will reshape the area from a vacant lot into a community hub and tourist attraction to better serve our residents and attract what we estimate to be 1.5 million visitors annually. Our decision today to approve additional funding for a new central public library will have a long lasting impact as this building is designed to last over 100 years. Notre décision aura des impacts à long terme, car ce bâtiment est conçu pour durer 100 ans. Given uh, Adesaki's wide range of positive ramifications for Ottawa, we can't afford to give up on it. The increased costs, and I think it, we should be very, very clear, these are not cost overruns. We get uh, general estimates that are worked on by our staff and professionals, and then we only know the real cost when the tenders come in and they're opened up. So to suggest this is a cost overrun is not uh, true. Uh, this is uh, obviously costing additional dollars. We recognize that, but we've also been told the legitimate reasons why this has taken place. Rise in material prices, important short, uh, short labor shortage due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, Ottawa's economy, as Mr. Willis said, is on fire. It's getting fired up again. We have the lowest unemployment rate of any large city, the top six or seven cities in Canada. And any delay, those who have suggested changing the location, looking for vacant buildings and so on, this will only result in greater costs. More importantly, we've already sunk $30 million into this project and we have a legally binding agreement with Library and Archives Canada to bring Adesake to fruition as soon as possible. Now, do you need any uh, proof that city building is difficult? It took over 25 years of dithering and foot dragging before we signed off on an arts court renovation and new Ottawa Art Gallery. It took over 25 years of dithering and foot dragging before we signed off on the Innovation Center at Bayview and phase one of Lansdowne Park. The, city, the history of the city demonstrates that delaying major infrastructure investments only ends up costing us a lot more later on. City building projects are always costly and they're not always easy. Rebuilding Elgin Street was $38 million. The work being done on Montreal Road is $57 million. The floor of footbridge is almost $19 million. At completion, these three projects will cost over $120 million. Yes, this remains a significant investment, but a necessary one for our future and that of the children and the grandchildren of our residents. 
Libraries are critical to the health, well-being, vibrancy, and wealth of communities. And they're the great equalizer. They've always been described as that. No admission, uh, free use, uh, gathering spots for debate and uh, job uh, searches and sharing information and, and fighting loneliness, quite frankly. They provide us safe spaces for everyone to use, including vulnerable members of our community. And as I said, they're global equalizers. Everybody, regardless of status, will be able to enjoy world-class collections, programming spaces, and architecture. And I could see the members of the committee were excited when Leslie was talking about some of the treasures that will be available for the public to see. I think of John McRae's original uh, poem, Flanders Fields, the first map ever discovered with the word Canada on it, and the list goes on and on. Tout le monde, peu importe son statut, pourra profiter de la bibliothèque de classe mondiale. And this will not only be a state-of-the-art facility, and the only one of its kind in Canada, also uh, the product of unprecedented consultation with Indigenous peoples. Kinigan Zibi and Anishinaabeg and the Algonquins of Pikmaknagan First Nation have led the design of this facility that breathes the spirit of reconciliation. And I very much appreciate their presentations uh, today when we heard from Anita and Della. Uh, they appreciated the fact they're not being called in at the tail end of the process. They've been right at the table from day one. It will also be a net zero carbon building, a LEED Gold certified facility, a first for a public library in, all, in Canada. The chair and the project team have uh, explained why the cost has increased, which unfortunately the city uh, has the, or fortunately the city has the ability to observe. And I re really appreciate the uh, uh, the response from Wendy and um, her team, Isabel, with respect to the replacing of uh, expired debt with new debt uh, to keep it debt neutral. Uh, this is going to be a landmark of its time. It addresses both the need for reconciliation and the need to tackle climate change. It's a legacy uh, building and a first step towards sustainable development for La Breton Flats. I want to thank personally Councillor Luloff, uh, Councillor Tierney, and Councillor Harder. Councillor Harder started this ball rolling, as we all know, when she was the forceful chair of the Ottawa Public Library and got this project going. Councillor Tierney got it to the next level, uh, bringing on the federal government. And now we have our colleague, Councillor Luloff, who is uh, passionate about this project. Like I've, I've never seen someone uh, as passionate. Reached out to the Right Honourable Beverly McLaughlin, put together an amazing fundraising team, uh, worked to uh, make this the most uh, consulted building, uh, I think, in the, certainly in the last 25 years. I've never seen a con consultation process that's attracted so many people. And the excitement of seeing that beautiful building, uh, you know, rising from the escarpment, overlooking the beautiful and historic Ottawa River, and right next to it, an affordable housing project. As you know, we brought forward that proposal that Council approved unanimously to put affordable housing, and then there'll be an affordable housing component at the NCC property, and that will create literally tens of thousands of people within walking distance of that particular site. When you look at the current site, if you look out 500 to 1,000 meters and put a radius, no one lives in that radius except one person. The owner of the Lord Elgin Hotel lives on the top floor. There are no other residential properties within 500 to 1,000 meters. There are going to be tens of thousands plus uh, access to public transit, which the current site uh, does not have good access to public transit. So I'd encourage my colleagues on FEDCO to uh, send this report to Council. Uh, we thank the Library Board trustees. They have uh, their uh, meeting today, and we, we hope it goes well for them. And we look forward to this item coming back with two reports, both from the library and from FEDCO at our next council meeting. So uh, yeas and nays on the uh, staff recommendations, please, Caron. on. Monsieur Cloutier. Oui. Councillor Dedouz. Yes. Councillor El Chantiri. Yes. Councillor Gower. Yes. Councillor Hubley. Yes. Conseil Boulot. Yes, and thank you, everyone. Councillor Moffat. Yes. Councillor Tierney. Yes. Vice Chair Dudas. Yes. Mayor Watson. Yes. Ten years. Great. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, motion to adjourn. Councillor Dudas. Carried. Adopted. Yes. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Merci. Thank you all very much. And to our staff, thank you for the great work and presentation. Merci. Meeting adjourned.